making some recommendations to the meeting here this afternoon. Did you get it working? Yeah. We got your report of work. So now everything will be on the tape. Thank you. Keep that in mind. <laughs> the tape is already wrong. working. <laughs> <laughs> so having said that, the first order of business is the minutes of the last board meeting of September the 11th. Which all of you received copies. Would you like those read? Uh, anybody know of any corrections need to be made, or would you like to approve them? I'll move we approve them as sent out. That approved as the minutes of September 11th is sent out. You get a second to that I'll motion? That. Yes, all right, any discussion? <coughs> all in favor of that motion signify to say an aye. Aye. Uh, opposed? Motion carried and so ordered. Now we also, you also should have received the minutes of the executive committee meeting of, uh, what was the date of that one, Tom? I've got a couple. December 5th. December 5th. Let's see, I've got it here. One of the others. Trying to find it. Okay, December 3rd. December 3rd. Now, have all of you read those minutes? It won't be necessary for the full board to approve those minutes, but there's several items in there that uh, will be taken up here this afternoon as a result of uh, action on that uh, committee. I think perhaps we ought to go ahead and present the minutes that the board, uh, uh, we perhaps ought to approve them. So uh, well, I'll present that <laughs> matter to you. Uh, we can get a motion to <coughs> approve or however you want and then perhaps have a little discussion about a couple of items in the minutes for the benefit of the full board. Can we get a motion to approve those minutes? That's so moved. And we get a second on that motion. All right, now before we put the question, does any member of the board have any questions in regards to any item taken up at that meeting? <coughs> Keeping in mind we have a couple of constitutional changes that that you'll be reviewing in a few minutes as a result of that executive committee meeting. <coughs> I thought you might want to have a little discussion perhaps on the reason we cancel out the drug program and things of that kind. Uh, I don't think there's anybody any questions about that on the Anybody anymore. understand the reason that was done? Do we have any questions now on, on those minutes before we put the matter to a vote? If not, then all in favor of the motion to adopt, signify it to say an aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried and so ordered. <coughs> all right, the <coughs> executive committee met again this morning, at least a majority of them did. Bob Woodson tied up in negotiations and couldn't be present. Apparently, Brother Tucker had some kind of a problem he couldn't get over either this morning, but we did have uh, a majority of the executive committee present this morning and reviewed uh, a couple of resolutions primarily uh, that involves two constitutional changes. Uh, one, of course, uh, involves the increase in per capita at the next convention. The day committee, we had quite a discussion about a number of other matters, realizing that uh, there are a few other things that perhaps the board <coughs> might ought to think about in terms of constitutional changes, but decided because of the importance of the per capita increase that perhaps in this convention we ought to defer any recommendations <coughs> on additional constitutional changes and stick with the two that we have. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? Now, Resolution 2 uh, is self-explanatory. I'd like you to look at that one. Resolution <coughs> 2 uh, come about as a result of President Mina's office rejecting a number of constitutional changes adopted at the last convention because they had not been submitted in accordance with the constitutional provisions on amending the Constitution. There's one sentence, and if you'd like, uh, I don't think I've bought enough copies of the Constitution for everybody, but 
I think it'd be well for me to read that part of it as relates to constitutional changes for the benefit of those of you not on the executive committee. And then, then we'll, we'll explain to you what this is all about. This is section two of article 12 in the constitution which outlines the amending procedure. This constitution may be amended by any regular convention or by any special convention called for that purpose by two-thirds of the votes cast. <coughs> All proposed amendments submitted by an affiliated organization, <coughs> the executive committee or the general executive board shall be in writing and properly certified to by the secretary of the sponsoring group. All proposed amendments shall be submitted to the secretary of treasurer of the council no later than 60 days prior to the convention. Copies of all proposed amendments shall be mailed to each affiliate no later than 35 days prior to the convention. The convention, this is the hooker now, the convention, constitution, and bylaws committee shall be vested with authority to propose any amendments it deems proper. Now, the amendments that were adopted at the last convention all come out of the <coughs> Constitution and Bylaws Committee under the authority of that last sentence. Then when we submitted them to uh, Mina's office, they were rejected because they had not been mailed out to the affiliated organizations in accordance with the language I read you. In other words, uh, amendments of this kind should be submitted to the affiliated organizations uh, no later than 35 days prior to the convention in order for those affiliated organizations to have an opportunity to study him before their delegates <coughs> come to a convention. And it was uh, pointed out to us that that last sentence is actually in violation of the rules and regulations of the National AFLC as it pertains to this organization which is of course charted by the national organization. So resolution two is simply a uh, resolution to drop that last sentence to get the Constitution in compliance with the national rule. That's really that simple. Does everybody understand that? Uh, those of you not on the committee? So the executive committee recommends that resolution and we'll put that one first before we get to the other. Do we have a motion now? This, this will all be submitted uh, by the full executive board now. Uh, one and if it's approved, not by this executive committee. So it becomes the property of the whole board. Make a motion for resolution number two be adopted. Second. Any discussion on that resolution? All right, you ready for the question? All in favor of the motion signify it to say an aye. Aye. Uh, opposed? Motion carried and so ordered. Get the sound of that trap we well, got in last time. It's a wonder. So that eliminates the, the now. <coughs> you know, Claude, yeah. it's, it's a wonder when you sent those things in, the dang, the national office happened to believe you that this has been in violation. That's the way our international does. If there's something in them, we send them in for one correction. They sit down and prove freedom and the policies change. They correct it. <laughs> correct everything. Correct else. all she well, that's, yeah. that well, they language has been in that thing for years. It ain't anything new, but this no. is the first time anything like this has ever yeah. come up. That's right. Yeah, Everybody they just we we right. send our bylaws. Well, they in. might have not had those. Their rule might have been rule made since. Might have been made. Well, the personnel have. I got an changed. idea that it was. And they've <laughs> changed the rules and regulations <laughs> up there. No. You know, they're subject to change. Well, well, anyhow, that's the reason for it. Well, actually, I agree with that. I really yeah. don't think the convention ought to amend the Constitution unless the affiliated organizations has had it mailed out and knows what in the world they're voting on. Well, I think this is correct. If it comes up on the floor at the last minute, then... Uh, I really believe it's a violation of federal law. <coughs> no, no, it might be. It could be. <laughs> well, well, anyhow... Lyndon Griffiths? All right, please. <laughs> It would be on that basis. Well, well, you've got to know that. Lenham Griffin don't, don't, don't apply to the local central bodies. Therefore, I don't think it would. I don't know. Just give a proper yeah. notification. No, that ain't the proper right. notification. Well, anyhow, that's the reason everybody understands it, and that resolution will be submitted. If any questions are raised, then uh, you'll be in a position to answer those questions. Now, the other resolution <coughs> is rather lengthy. And 
I uh, spent a lot of time on this one, went back and reviewed for the benefit of the newly affiliated organizations more than anything else, uh, the history of uh, the program of progress when we got into all of this, when uh, the dues was increased, when we put on a dollar assessment uh, to raise the money to purchase the equipment and the, the staff, the whole thing. Now, uh, the Day Committee has had an opportunity to read the resolution, but we, we'd like to <coughs> afford the rest of the board, of course, an opportunity to read it, or maybe we ought to read it together. Why don't you read it, Tom? We'll just read it together. And then at the end, uh, this is going to be the most important thing we deal with at this convention, anyhow. Go what ahead and read it. What I have from a working person's point of view, the 1960 session of the legislature was the worst in our state's history. It was during this session that our Workmen's Compensation Act was vir virtually emasculated. The tax burden was shifted to the backs of the working people and the so called right to work law placed in the state's constitution. When this session was over, the leadership of the Mississippi AFL-CIO realized that organized labor must become more active politically if we were to survive. Bluntly stated, our enemies forced us to move in this direction. And whereas, after considerable thought and study, the executive board presented a program of progress to the delegates at a special convention in 1961. <coughs> This program spelled out an 18-point legislative proposal and provided the necessary revenue for which to finance it. In addition to the monthly dues of 10 cents per member, the dedicated assessment of $1 per member per year was levied. The total cost of affiliated local unions was 22 and a half cents per member per month. This additional revenue permitted the officers of the organization to purchase necessary equipment to conduct intensive voter registration campaigns <coughs> to communicate with rank and file members during an election year. The second full-time officer and additional secretary were placed on the payroll. And whereas in 1964, the delegates in attendance at the regular convention voted to eliminate the dollar dedicated assessment and set the monthly dues at the present rate of 20 cents per member per month. This was done in a sincere effort to affiliations from those local unions who claimed they could not afford 22 and a half cents per member. A number of local unions did affiliate as a result of this action, but <coughs> the number did not and now not up to this day. The reduction of dues in 1964 and those and these continued free riders have had a measurable effect upon the financial problems of the Mississippi AFL-CIO. And whereas, as the record indicates, organized labor has made considerable progress in our state since 1961. Many of our legislative proposals have been enacted into law. We have been able to prevent massive passage of punitive measures on numerous occasions. Politically speaking, 1975 was a good year for the Mississippi labor movement. We helped elect a governor, lieutenant governor, and a majority to the House and Senate. We have every reason to believe that considerable progress will be made during the next four years. Of paramount importance is the fact that organized labor is well respected by both citizens. Today we are not held in open contempt as we were in 1960. We can be justly proud of our accomplishments during the last 15 years. And whereas the above mentioned progress has required the expenditure of a sizable sum of money, unfortunately these expenditures have far exceeded our income. As the audit committee will show, got a error over there. Uh, committee report will show a letter left on the show. Our bank balance is dangerously low. This applies to both the regular fund and the special legislative fund. Our expenditures in 1975 exceeded our income over $10,000. However, all of our financial problems are not attributable to expenditures of the 1975 election. Most of them can be attributed to the current economic situation of stagflation. Our income has been reduced because of unemployment. We have been dealt a severe blow by inflation. Operational costs have more than doubled during the past four years. For instance, 
Four years ago, we could do a mailing to the rank and file members during a political campaign for about $500. Today, a mailing of that kind costs over a thousand. To do a mailing to the officers of our affiliated organizations today costs approximately $100, and four years ago, it cost less than four. Whereas the executive board of the Mississippi AFL-CIO has not deemed it necessary to recommend the dues increase to any convention <coughs> since the special convention in 1961, continued growth and affiliation have made it possible to balance the budget on a year-to-year -year basis since that time. However, the board has recently reviewed the financial status of the organization and has come to the conclusion that will be in serious difficulty if this convention does not grant a dues increase of at least five cents per member per month. The board frankly feels that continued progress is dependent upon the action of this, the eighth biannual convention. Now therefore be <coughs> resolved that section one of article 10 be amended to read 25 cents per member <coughs> per month and that the word 20 be changed to 25 where it where it appears elsewhere in the Constitution. Be it further resolved that this constitutional change become effective as of April 1st, 1976. There's a couple of <coughs> typo errors in that, but we'll make those corrections. <coughs> that is the recommendation of the Executive Committee of the Board now on the, on the subject of the need of uh, a capital increase. Can we get a motion out to adopt the uh, committee's recommendation to the board? I so move to the council. Discussion? Second. Second. All right. Do we have any discussion <coughs> on the resolution now? Don't hesitate to speak your mind now. And where there's no pride in authorship, you think this resolution can be improved, don't hesitate to uh, to say where. Call me ask Yes. Uh, what, don't you think it would be helpful get this resolution passed in our next convention by showing how many members you've lost uh, during the previous years you've talked about up to date. Uh, well, maybe you would have to go back that far. You could probably during the year 1975, I'm sure how many members you've lost during that time. You mean you talk about unemployment? The yeah, it dropped out. The affiliation talked about the affiliation uh, thing. Right. Yeah. I think that would be helpful. <coughs> Uh, you want us to come up with some figures of locals not affiliated? Uh, some that were affiliated yeah. during the time the 20 cents was, you know, was added, was added there. During the time the 20 cents, and uh, to show how many <coughs> members you have to date, and how many you had at that time when the 20 cents was added, and how many members you lost uh, because of inflation during the year of 1965. Well, We've lost some, but we've picked up. As far as our well, overall we're affiliation, we're well, still... From <coughs> point of view, uh, we've uh, made considerable progress in right. the affiliation thing. Uh, well, there's been expansion of the labor movement. <coughs> right. right. You go. And some, of course... We hadn't really went down, though, as he was referring. Yeah. I don't believe I think it. I know what Lewis is talking about. Now, you know, I'm well pleased, frankly, uh, over the uh, affiliation picture in several areas especially building trade unions, and perhaps we ought to kick this one around a little bit because it's all pertinent. Uh, for instance, operating engineers, we got them affiliated, finally. Uh, long story behind all of that, but you know, this is a local union and has never been affiliated since <coughs> it emerged. Um, but as well, I think, a lot of our activity in Tom Bigby and the fact that we inducted Finch into the Operating Engineers Union perhaps had a bearing on it. <laughs> the fact is, Operating Engineers are now affiliated. Uh, one of the big AFGE locals uh, and uh, the, the Keith of <coughs> uh, on the Gulf Coast recently affiliated. They've got a total membership of what, eight, nine hundred? About eight, nine. Yeah, yeah between eight and nine hundred. They come in. Uh, we've got several locals that are in arrears right now. You've got that before you. Uh, that are in arrears that don't won't get the convention <coughs> call until they get the dues Keep paid the up board. through the Keep month of uh, November. They're not uh, suspended. They're not suspended, but they're not eligible to receive the call. Now we had a lot larger group than this until Tom got a communication out 
several of them come on in there to have, and, we, and he's sending them to call. You know, we got this type of a situation. Now, uh, we still got a large number of locals that uh, are still out. Uh, some of them have been in recently, and some of them haven't. Some of them never been in the ball of <coughs> for instance, and um, Pascagoula have been out ever since. Uh, well, they were out before we adopted the program of progress. They dropped out because they disagreed with this organization when we supported Carol Gordon for governor over Ross Barnett. That was the beginning of that problem. <laughs> you know, we got reason Tip to hope that perhaps America. they'll come back. Okay. Now, we got other kinds of problems, Lewis. Uh, most of them are money now. We've got a number of local unions that are predominantly black in membership. And the one that comes to mind off the top of my head is Local 800, the chemical workers local in Greenwood, the Baldwin Piano local. Uh, that's a big local union, and they're in the lane, but they're in the rears now, and of course, they, you got problem with them yourself, uh, you know. Well, we can, Lewis, put together a list that we can identify of local unions that are out uh, he either dropped out since our last convention and tried to identify some that have never been affiliated. Get me? Yeah, I understand what you're saying, yeah. but what I was, uh, you answered my question. Yeah. All right, but what, what I was speaking of, the, the number of local unions that did affiliate, yeah. did the total number uh, membership wise uh, overcome the number that was dropped out? You might find on the dedicated assessment <coughs> thing back when we dropped it back to right. 20 oh, He's talking about the last no. year. He's yeah. last year. He said, is our membership more or less now than it was January the 1st, 75? Oh, it's more. It's, it's more. increased. It's increased. We've increased. lost it. No, our affiliation is better now than it was right. two years ago, if that's your question. Right. Yes. We've got... Uh, we got friend. Well, we've got one or two that's delinquent. I'll, I'll, I'll name you a couple, <laughs> Joe. Uh, IBW, uh, 903 in Gulfport, Jimmy Rush is local. Uh, they're out. <coughs> they're completely out. They, they're delinquent. They have been for some time. And of course, we've done everything we know to try to keep them in. The Carpenters Local in Pascagoula is another local union that's got in arrears and is now out. Uh, they've got financial problems. We are doing what we can to try to work with them, get them back in. Uh, well, Sanders in the same category in Pascagoula. But you know, this is a continual thing. You work your butt off to get one local affiliated. While you're doing this, somebody else goes out the back door, you know? <laughs> but in balance, I'd say we're in a little better shape than we were two years ago, at least at our last convention. Yeah, see why I brought yeah. the question up. I know in our local unions, in order to try to get dues raised there, yeah. we got to go show a lot show the member yeah uh, the need for the money yeah the need for the money yeah. the loss and gain and all that kind of stuff that's why i brought the money yeah all right well uh, now you got you like should have before you now cost of service yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. we also <coughs> we also had some discussion to the committee the last time we met again this morning about the council's financial condition You've got that information in front of you. Maybe you ought to look at that a little bit and and I'm talk about. To. Huh? I'm scared. To. <laughs> well, that's the first time I've seen on a piece of paper this small. <laughs> <laughs> Must be rough. Huh? Must be rough. <laughs> We've got well, we got to conserve on paper too. Um. Uh, so that if you look at the facts and figures there. Uh, that gives you a pretty good indication about, you know, some of our financial problems. As you'll note, <coughs> in January 1 of 75, we had $22,000 approximately in general fund. And as the uh, end of 75, that was down to 12430 which means that we spent $10,000 more in 75 than we did in uh, in the previous year, in 74. Of course, it was election year, and we pointed this out in the 
in the resolution. On the special legislative fund, uh, we show uh, about $1,000 more in that fund than we had in the beginning uh, of the year, for instance. Now, that can be attributed for several different reasons. Uh, one, of course, is that we we beg money from all the international, from the National Coke, from uh, IUD and other elsewhere. And we wound up with a little more money in this fund uh, at the end of the year than we had when we started. But I must tell you this, if we were to reimburse the general fund for all of the money that we spent in conjunction with the legislative program, then that fund would be down considerably and we could improve the we'd improve the general fund slightly, but it's just like robbing Peter to pay Paul. It, we, we're looking <laughs> at the total amount, it don't change the overall picture very much. Uh, and I guess perhaps uh, we ought to, while we're talking <coughs> about money, tell you had we not got that last assistance from the national organization, we would indeed been in trouble this time around, especially in the general election. After the convention had endorsed Finch and the other nominees of the party, I called Al Barkin and we talked about money. And he said, well, what about me sending you $5,000 for Finch and $5,000 to help get out the vote? I said, Al, oh, that sounds mighty good. That was a little more than I expected to get out of it. And, uh, of course, I guess I caught him at the right time. So he sent us a check for $10,000. We had $5,000 in to put in the special legislative fund to help <laughs> us to pay the cost of getting out the vote and what have you in the election. We have already, of course, give the Finch organization the five that we, that we sent in uh, just an outright contribution to, to that effort. Now that uh, $5,000 to help get out that vote in November is what saved us. This is what I'm trying to get across to you. Had we not had that $5,000 to have spent, and had we not got a few contributions, for instance, the machinists give us 500 you know, and we got a little money here and there from the different organizations, we would have been in, in real bad shape. We wouldn't have been able to produce the results we did, uh, Cecil, you know, and. Uh, you know what I'm talking about. And of course, the the different unions, uh, uh, I think, come through real good. I'm well pleased with the response and the help we got. But to go back to the matter, Lewis, centers around the fact that we've not got this help out of the national office, especially in the November election, this organization would have been virtually busted today. You know, we're, We've just about, we ju we're just about, uh, you know, to go under is what it all adds up to. And frankly, if the convention does not approve a dues increase, then we're, I don't know where we, what we're going to do, but we're going to have to start re uh, cutting back on our programs and a lot of things that we've been doing because the cost of everything is going through the ceiling. Now, <laughs> those of you... <laughs> Some of you, I know a fellow like James Jackson, for instance, running the joint board, and perhaps Kelly with the Machinist Council, and, uh, well, all of you know what I'm talking about. But in, the, in and we point this out in a resolution, I'm <coughs> telling you, it's, it's almost unbelievable the way things have gone through the ceiling in terms of cost. You know, you name it, you tell it. We, we mentioned Malin, all is one example. It is a big item, mailing. That's where we spend a lot of our money. Um, you know. Now, <laughs> that's why I brought the question. Yeah. Telephone, no light, water, gas, name it. The organization needs this uh, uh, increase in the capital. We need that. That's why I said we, we have as much evidence. You want as much show. information as you can to talk yeah, to show stuff. To show the, the members of the convention. Right. Well, <laughs> come on, just read this in and say that. Unless you got a lot of evidence there to show them why you need this, then you might lose this resolution on the floor. I think we're going to have right. to prepare some right. factual information like you're talking about, and we'll try to have that ready when the matter is brought on the floor. We'll get ready for that now. If you notice, we went to pretty good length on the resolution. 
Going back to the special, well, <coughs> the sixth session of the legislature, the reason we, uh, the executive board at that time, and I guess, Jim, you and, is anybody else here besides the Marvin was on? Marvin was Marvin, there, yeah. Tom, Marvin, and myself, I believe, were the only members of the board, the present board, that was on that board. Am I correct? I believe that's right. I believe that's right. Geez, might have been. Were you on the board? I don't remember. I don't think, Jim. I think I came on in 63 or 63. Yeah, it was a little after that, I believe, in D's. But the reason for going back and reviewing this like we did is for the benefit of people like yourself (coughs) that are on the board. And, of course, the benefit of those people that's not on the board. Because there's a lot of people out there don't even know about the special convention of 1961. And the reason that this was done is because to try to do a better job politically, and that all come about as a result of the bad session in 1960. And I can tell you here at the table what it might be worth, and I feel pretty damn good today. Looking back on uh, some of the problems we had during that period, and these has been around for a while now, with us around the legislature, and uh, Dan Ory, as uh, of course we got the authority from Jim Solid for him to help us some around the legislature now. But there's just as much difference in daylight to dark today around that legislature as there was in that period of 1960. We're well respected. And, uh, you know, people have run across all the way across the Capitol, for instance, now to shake our hand when we go over there, that type of thing. So we have come a long ways, and I'm proud of it. The fact is we're in financial trouble now. Um, yeah. Well, could I say something? Yeah. And then we'll get you. Well, another thing that could be brought out, I ain't got any records on it, but I know what's happened. Uh, just say a local union's been paying 73 and 72 and 3 on 500 members. Mm-hmm. Then this recession hit and they laid off and they went to paying on 300 members. Yeah, or 100 or whatever. Yeah, they had got a lot of that. <laughs> and a lot of our people think the local union, especially construction locals, they yeah. don't lay off. They still pay on. I know. Uh, but they still pay dues. Yeah. But manufacturing locals don't, so they don't pay for capital tax here on it. Right. And uh, it might be something brought out. I think this is the type of thing that, that we can do. definitely show you. For instance, the big Bosch local over in Columbus is a good example, isn't it, Calvin? They, they were running, what, somewhere around 1,000 months. They had a big layoff <coughs> over there, and they cut back to where, around 300 for a while? This is uh, Columbus 793. Yeah. But they dropped lower than that. Yeah, they went down to the 400. This is what we're talking about unemployment hitting us. You see, the industrial unions that Dees is talking about, when they had a layoff, they wasn't collecting dues from these laid off members. Therefore, we didn't get dues. Now, this is the type of thing that's really hurt us as far as <laughs> our income. We lost, you might point out, we lost three complete local unions. We've had well, some plants shut out. Right. That's what I was talking right. about. Well, right. wasn't, wasn't, it, yeah, wasn't, it, it, wasn't it actually, oh, regardless of the number of members you had, uh, uh, if you're doing a mail out and every, all this, you know, everything goes up with the number of members you've got, the thing just the regular cost of operating the office is what you got to look at, the total number of members. That, yeah, right. Yeah. See, we and lost I just, that 500-member uh, local in Oklahoma. They hadn't been working a year, yeah. for a year next that month, and we still have not got nobody in that plant. They're still. I mean, lost one, and the rubber workers lost one. Yeah. Yeah. You right. say in 1964 was the last increase, and in, that's when the 20 cents was put well, in, right? Six, six, six well, we cut it yeah, back. Wow. The total cost 64. was 22 and a half cents in 61, yeah. and we made it 20 cents across the board Lord in 64. 64. Actually, that two and a half cents reduction. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's been 20 cents ever since. Yeah, I just did some yeah. quick figures from 64 yeah. to 75. Uh, this yeah. nickel increase is all we're looking at. That's a total of two and a half percent increase over 11 years. Boiled it down to something less than one quarter percent increase a year. And the cost of living has been going up at seven, eight, nine, tens along. So yeah. we're talking about well, <laughs> up until we're talking about nothing. You know? Up until recent years, the growth of the organization, new affiliates, had offset the additional cost of operation. Then we get into this 
period of stagflation, laid off workers, inflation, and our growth hasn't been enough to overcome it. It's really that simple. Now, Marvin, you had your hand up. Do you want to pull uh, up? If you don't mind, I'll stand up. Yes. Not to make a speech, but I <clears throat> see who I'm talking to and maybe dodge brickbats, if any. <laughs> uh, start with, I'm say that I'm going to vote in favor of submitting this resolution, number one. But I'd like to point out, <clears throat> speaking for Cartons and maybe for a lot of other built and trades people, uh, we, <clears throat> we may have a higher percentage of unemployment than maybe some of the other trades. Well, I don't know, but we have had a tremendous amount nationwide as well as uh, right. at the local levels in the area in which we live. At our last State Council of Cardinals Convention, we raised our per capita tax. At the last General Convention, the General uh, uh, International Union raised our per capita tax, 20 cents per month per member, January 1, 1976. <coughs> We have another 20 cents per month per member coming up raised to the International Union on July 1, 1976. Now, of course, we affiliated with the Building Trades Council. We try to affiliate with all of the <coughs> uh, appropriate uh, bodies. Uh, and our work, uh, and now I'm speaking largely in our particular area, uh, Brother Turner, we are still in a depressed state as far as uh, <coughs> employment is concerned. <coughs> Our local union is operating in the red every day. I don't know whether that's generally true with carpenters and the other building trades Excuse or not. We're being put into a squeeze. Now, hopefully, by the middle of this summer, our work will have uh, bounced back and we will have maybe uh, on a paying basis as far. Now here's what happens when our people get unemployed. Some of them go suspended. We, uh, we have about the same situation at a local level as you're talking about the <coughs> this level. <coughs> we take in a few people and we lose it. They come in the front door and some of them go out the back door. Right. <coughs> and then they pay dues, the ones that do stay in, pay just enough to stay in. They might be five months behind. And it's our like international union has here. even made a provision right. that uh, we have now 12 months. We've never had that before, by which they can, uh, if they pay up in 12 months, they feel in the same pinch at the international level that we are due to inflation and unemployment. Right. Uh, don't be surprised, as I say, I'm going to vote for it. But don't be surprised if somebody amends this to provide, maybe, that this take effect, say, July instead of April. I wouldn't be surprised. And I, I'd rather think that you'll have some opposition flat out entirely. But just be, don't be surprised if, uh, if uh, an amendment is made or you have a lot of negative votes. I'm just throwing that out now for whatever it may be worth. Thank you. I think you're right. And, of course, I... I think that <coughs> if once we, if we adopt it, then we're obligated to do everything we can to provide everybody with as much information as we can to justify the increase, which I think is in line with what Lewis <coughs> brought up. Now, Tom and I kicked this one around a little bit, and I'll throw this out for your consideration also. We didn't get uh, uh, too far with it. We did talk about uh, the audit committee whether or not uh, Mayor Bryant should serve on it by virtue of the fact that she is now a member of the board and for whatever it might be worth, uh, Mayor, the board felt, uh, the committee felt that, that you ought to be on the audit committee. <coughs> and we'll get into all that later on if you want to know why I'm reason for it. <coughs> Number one, of course, is the fact that you've had the experience and it's important to have some people on this committee that knows what, <coughs> how to put together an audit committee report. But the thing that I'm about to say, I, we didn't get around to kicking this around with the executive committee, so we'll just all kick this one around <coughs> together. Because of the importance of the dues increase and because of some things that, for instance, Lewis, that we've been talking about, it might be well 
in this convention for us to make the full audit committee report available to all the delegates in the convention. We haven't done that in recent years because uh, people let the thing fall around and get in the hands of the wrong people. But we don't want anybody to think that we're trying to hide anything, and if that audit <coughs> committee report uh, is what's needed to justify the increase, and as far as I'm concerned, you know, we'll put it out there for them. We might want to kick this one around a little bit, too, while we're talking on the subject. What do you think? Uh, you know, I think that we've got a pretty good cross-section of, of the different the board. unions on this yeah, board. We have. We throw that audit report out there to three or four hundred people. It's definitely going to get in the wrong hand. You can rest assured of that. Well, no through some people, huh? There's no question about that. Yeah, you know, three or four hundred people. Some of it is going to get, like you say, in the wrong hands. I'd be against putting it out without the delegates voted to do so. Uh, put it, make it available for any of them to look at it. You know, but you. I wouldn't want it put out on the street, not 400 copies of it. <laughs> they'd, they'd have a front page ad. If anybody got, it, got a hold of it, you what could I, get some I problems. Would, what I would suggest is yeah. you send a copy of it to each local oh. union that's affiliated. And when they have that regular meeting, they could read it to their membership and explain it to their membership. They're going to have the same local union to have delegates. So the only problem with that, would you have it read the mail prior to the board, uh, to mm -hmm. the convention? The audit report? Yeah. Sure. It got mailed out for what, 35 days? Let's, let's kick that around a little bit. If you did, it wouldn't help. See if it got added or not. Let's see what the process is. Well, that audit report would be mailed out for 300 copies. Might as well have it. Uh, she's ready to turn the books <laughs> over to the certified <laughs> right. public accountant. And then we'll have to wait till they come back from the accountant he's to turn them over to the audit committee. <coughs> Now, Mary, let me ask you a question. You was on the last audit committee, and you'll be on this one, uh, if you accept it, of course. Uh, once you get the books, how long would you say it would take the audit committee to prepare a report for the time we're talking about that you'd present to the convention, something we could put in writing or mail it? Well, it I know depends. it took you several weeks uh -huh. as you worked at night and that's uh, when you could on it, you know. It'll depend on the, uh, the people on the committee. How if, hard it is to get If they're them. available. Uh, could I, well, to answer your question, yeah. I don't know. It, it would depend on the people on the committee. Yeah. Uh, also, um, and if they'll get together, you know, how, how our other commitments are running. Right. So that we could get together. I'll confer and, uh, with you. I'll make you challenge the more. Of course, we get Lord. ready to point the other. <laughs> no, I'm sincere about this, and no, I'm, I'm putting you on notice now. The members of this board and the vice president can be expected to be chairman of committees. Those of you are not chairman are going to be on committees, you know, because uh, I think it's important. Uh, one of our problems two years ago is centered around the fact that. That the board itself didn't know what the Constitution Committee was coming out with. This is part of the problem. Right. But anyhow, I'll confer with you. Now, you had Marinell on there with you. Uh, Tyson is, uh, is retired. Of course, he was sick and couldn't meet with you. Anyhow, you and Marinell actually did the work. That's right. But I'll consult with you and let you make some recommendations. I think a three-member committee is big enough for this job. It's hard to get a big one together. We've had a three-member committee as long as I've been around. And, uh, you know, I'll sit down with you, and uh, if Mary Nell's accepted, we'll put her back on, and then we'll try to come up with that third member, somebody that's available, can meet with you and Mary Nell, get ready. That's where we'll do all that. Well, I was going to say I'd like to see some, of course, I realize the hazards of our occupation yeah, <laughs> in appointing people, but if we could appoint people have participated because I've run into the same situation otherwise. Right. You got one dragging his feet all the time. Right. And it's better if everyone does participate. And I'd be glad to serve on it. Um if we could really get to it, it wouldn't take long. We could try to the CPA do a cost study for you. Well the purpose in us auditing it, I, if I'm not mistaken, is the same as it is such as at the local level, right. 
is for lay people right. who are familiar with labor business right. to look at it. Absolutely. Because this was proven and pointed out in our uh, organization here in the state right. that uh, a professional person can look at it and they can verify the accuracy of the bookkeeping right. procedure. I'm talking about a cost percentage increase over your expenses. This guy that he's got all the books, what I'm, you know, your expenses. Well, now, if they want to uh, save you some time. make some comparison studies and yeah. all of that, yeah. I think that's what they were talking about yeah. having available to present to the convention. I'm like, Lewis, if you've got some arguments, some things to show them, that's yeah. good. Uh, but um, we could go right on and try to expedite our business as soon as the books are available and, and if yeah. the people are available to go right. on and do it. I don't mind, of course, I spend much of my time on Saturday and Sunday doing union business anyway. <laughs> <Don't we laughs> my own bookkeeping yeah. business. Oh, and see, I'm involved in the, you know, the CLU books yeah. and the, my local <coughs> books and all that. So. Um, as far as the time in the day, other than my working hours, which I, you know, if you want to pay for those, that's fine, but I can spend Sundays or whatever if these other people will. I'm willing to. Well, of course, a lot uh, depends on when the audit committee, how much well, time. We, we should, uh, could probably, and if you took Mary Nell and I and one more person, now someone that's done it before can do it faster, too. Well, that's you know. really the important how those people that's been on that before on sure. there again. You're not just sitting right. there trying to get together for a couple of days right. before you know what right. you're doing. <coughs> well, if we get the audit, uh, uh, the, the certified public accountant audit back uh, <coughs> within a period of two or three weeks and then get you another good person to review with me uh, uh, to work with you and Mary Nell. <coughs> take you, what, two or three weeks, perhaps, to get the thing? I don't done. think it would take us that long if we'd really get with it, you know. I think could, we can have something get ready to go to print, say, around March 1, the mail to the local union. Oh, no, I feel sure. Will you come? No, that's on the 35 days. Come uh, no, it wouldn't have to affect, no. The, we, the resolution has amendment. to go out on constitutional change. No. 35 days, but we could say in the correspondence we mail this out that a copy of the audit committee's report oh, will be mailed to each affiliate prior to the convention. As soon as it's uh, complete, <laughs> be nice if you yeah. could mail well, it. Well, it would be good if we could, but I don't, don't hardly uh, think they can have it ready that quick. We, we're not that far away from the convention. It's supposed to be in March, <laughs> and this is already uh, almost the middle of January. <laughs> But I, I don't see how it would take to have if we could. I agree with you. If you're going to mail it to the local. I tell you what, if you're going to mail it out to the locals, you're still putting it out all yeah. over the state and in the community. You might as well hand it There's out to the delegates. a lot of danger in that. see much difference in handing it out to the, to the delegates the than mailing it to the locals. Well, some of it will be lost in mail on somebody that don't belong to the local. Well, well, let's, let's, I mean, this is a decision for the board to make, and we're going to abide by whatever you decide to do. Uh, I'll tell you what I feel. I'll tell you what I feel, yeah. but I don't know if anybody else feels that way or where you could handle it this way. I'd have such a report ready, but I wouldn't mail it out nor give it out. And if it gets obvious at the convention that it's necessary, hand it out with the understanding that it'll be in the hands of the delegates only during the discussion on this thing and then take them all back up. Then they'll have it in front of them, they can deal with it, and then everybody turns it back in, then they don't float all over the state. Well, I was going to say something you know, along that line, because I'm a firm believer in not <coughs> passing out flyers on financial reports, <laughs> but um, if you had the report available at the convention, and because I know I get up and read these reports, Blah, 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 and they don't know what you say, but after a while, they, this one figure comes back yeah. to them from out of the... <laughs> Some place, yeah, right. <laughs> and they get all in a dither about it. If you had the reports available, then anybody who did want to really yeah. read it and analyze yeah. it could have it. Well, I thought we'd take the audit committee's report out before we take up the resolution. Let them get the full... 
back yeah, on black. the financial standing before we deal with the resolution. We right. thought we'd do it that way. Right. I don't we, think we ought to give it to nobody that don't request it and then know who we're giving it to when they do request couldn't it. Couldn't we have basically a... Basically, uh, is that. We're, if we're, a man requested it or something, uh, have it available for him. But if well, we, we just to have it out, that last, um, that's right. Be sure that it... Could, couldn't we have a, a, a small room set aside with the audit committee or table set up <coughs> with with it, you know, with so many copies where people come in and look over it okay. and leave it? In case somebody has forgotten, uh, that might be the way we use the last three or four conventions to send this, that we have a slip uh, which is a request to meet. And if anybody involved in an affiliated organization wants a copy of the audit, that's they fill out the they slip. send that in. Right. Mm -hmm. And we send them a copy. Otherwise, there's nothing. Right. Right. There's only been a couple of requests over the number of years. Well, how many? The how many only thing, the only thing is about that is it, with this situation, you might have well, more that's the reason I right. Right. people interested right at the convention. Right. But on the other hand, there are delegates there who are sent from uh, organizations might be rather insignificant people yeah. that could gain a copy of it just by passing it out. Right, yeah. that's the reason I say it. Might just be pass the, it out, the take it up, or do a request or, or whatever something. person of authority. How many different international unions is going to have their statewide meetings just prior to the convention, the weekend before the convention? There'll be several, but it won't be all of them. It won't be all of them. <coughs> no. i tell you why. Yeah, come on, don't what, have a organization. what I think perhaps is the way to deal with it. Uh, when they get their report ready, typed up, we'll run it off, we'll run off additional copies of it, have them on hand in the event it looks like they need to be passed out, but we won't pass them out unless it becomes necessary. This is where we'll take up the audit committee report get all that on their minds and immediately follow the audit committee report with resolution number one while all this is fresh in their mind. Then, in the course of the discussion of resolution one, That's the point. if it appears that it's, uh, that, it's, that, it's, that it's necessary to get copies of the audit report on the table That's in front of those delegates about. at that point, we will make it available. That's right. what I was talking about. Is this about what you think <coughs> would be the I way to Except I was ending it, put a box at the end of the table and be sure they turn them all back in so they don't float on yeah. out to the street and nowhere else. So. And prior to this, we're going to probably invite all of the press and all to leave, huh? Oh, yeah, we'll That'd have to be a closed okay. session. Yeah, uh, uh, we've always had an executive session when we get into this, and uh, I assume that the board would want this to be an executive session. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. That's true. I, I got along with what you said. Probably the only way to be able to do it, but if it comes, if it became necessary, where you have to pass it out in order to get each, every copy back, uh, yeah. why not get uh, each local union ha have a delegation there? Just sign one to that delegation. Let that delegation call them to go with that report and take the person's name and give it to them, and let them turn it back in with that delegation and get the copy. Uh, well, uh, we might have to deal with that fashion. We'll wait and see if we have to put it out. How many if we have to put it out, like then that. we'll have to request uh, some, sort of a deal. some sort of a deal and, and then advise them when they get back home if the local unions request a copy to let us know and we'll put one in the mail. What we're trying to guard against, frankly, is some body from the opposition will say the State Chamber of Commerce and the manufacturers are getting a hold of it, which they don't have any in its will. But if a local union wants to request the thing to be put in the mail after the convention, then at that point we'll send it to the affiliated right. office. Right. You know, if that thing is eight or ten yeah. pages long, it's four hundred. Claude, but I just want to show you what can happen. Uh, our international union mails out a financial statement to the yeah. secretary and treasurer and the president of each local. Right. And we don't have, uh, uh, but four in the state of Mississippi at the time that they were sent out. And when I was organizing this place up in Starbucks here, they posted a copy <laughs> of that financial report 
showing my salary and so forth on bulletin board now. Right. And if it wasn't but two went to each local and yeah, but the, now. The, yeah, they, they don't get that they off get that. that. From Landon that Gretchen. come from a labor Landon department. Do. This did not come from a labor department. It is a right. direct copy There's of my financial statement, which is never right. sent to the labor department. Or, uh, the figures is sent to the labor department, but not in this form. <laughs> So I know you can take things say every time it. we get in a campaign, they they well, do that to us. That's yeah. what we have to worry about. I understand, I, and I realize what you. It's a good point you bring it up, but this is out of our book. They pull a son of page out of our book. No, but what book. he's talking about, he's talking about the little money they pay for. Yes, the, sir. That comes from the CPA. That yeah, well, I doubt it. They ain't no copies of these. They're original in color. We uh, we went and voted on this. No, no, we ain't voted on anything yet. We still got Resolution 1 under consideration. We got on the Audit Committee thing <coughs> and answered us some questions about providing information to well, to put it over in the... Well, why don't we take a vote? Right, I know there's well, going to be I mean, some opposition, but I just don't can't believe it's going to be that I serious anyway. Not, I mean, there's, there's, there's the too widespread here of different yeah. internationals and... So we're going to get our people ready sure. at the state council meeting and all. He ain't all coming down here all blind. All of them is going to be programmed to support the thing. See, automatically, right. they don't even. Yeah, and that's what uh, I was thinking. James's group would be in and I'd well, be look, in the first in. place. I'll be meeting with mine within a week from now. And they'll know about it then. Well, let's dispose of the motion to adopt resolution one. I think we've got a. Are you ready to vote on resolution number one? Yeah, I'm ready. All in favor of the motion to adopt signify it by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried and so on. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, Mr. Taylor was talking about the 20 cents and James talking about 25. We sent our bylaws in one of the locals our largest local, matter of fact, and the due structure was 1020. Yeah. And it had been going up every year, you know, anywhere from 50 cents a dollar a year. And we had goofed up back in 1973, and uh, we'd raise our union dues when we get a contract raised, and we had plenty of money to operate on. So we just didn't raise. The Constitution says when you capital tax the international increase, your dues, you got to add that to your dues. So we didn't add it from 1973 on because we don't exactly go by all their rules we get caught up with. <laughs> Good job. And we sent them in to oh, change yeah. a couple of little <laughs> things in the bylaws that shouldn't even been changed to start with, just little picky stuff. <laughs> and they wrote us back a letter and says, we've reviewed your bylaws and back since uh, 1973, you have a bad by article so-and-so in the Constitution and you use the first of 75 was supposed to have been 11 and a dime, and it was supposed to have been 11.30 the first of 76, and they had to go from 10.20 to 11.30, and they come out today. <laughs> Jeff couldn't have called a board meeting at a better time. Yeah. Got you out of town. <laughs> <laughs> Let me. Let me see if I can get you back on the, on the uh, business here for a few yeah, minutes. Now, this is the major business of this board meeting. We do have a number of other matters that we need to perhaps have some discussion. I'd like to review with you the, <coughs> the uh, Democratic Party thing and all of that, and trace with you uh, where all we've been, what all we've been doing in conjunction with that. But we can do this tomorrow <coughs> for the benefit of everybody, and it's not really necessary at this time. Now, <clears throat> another matter that I wanted to take up at th in this session was to find out whether or not you want to start making some plans for a Labor Day program this year. Now, we'll have a meeting of our board immediately after the convention. If you think that that would be time enough to prepare and make a decision for a Labor Day program, we can defer action on that for the next board. I believe it would, Bob. I believe we'd have March time myself. September, undoubtedly, we'd have. You don't need to talk it to death. Huh? You don't need to talk it to death. So if it's right with y'all, we'll just defer taking in action and discussion <coughs> on whether or not we put on a special Labor Day program in, uh, in, uh, in 
76 or not. Uh, there's not much happened as far as the legislature is concerned. They just convened. The speaker just appointed committees this past week. Uh, the lieutenant governor won't be officially uh, installed until next week. Nothing's happened in the Senate. Their both houses are in a period of organization, so to speak. Uh, the governor will be inaugurated on the 20th, as all of you know. There won't be anything much happening in the legislature, really, until after he's in office and, and they get his program, which means it'll be around February 1st before the legislature really gets down to business. We have, I uh, have been talking with, uh, with, uh, with his legislative uh, liaison man, Bob Perry, about the possibility of uh, Bench uh, incorporating some of our program into his message of the legislature in areas such as unemployment and workers' comp. I have reason to believe perhaps that'll happen. If it does, it'll help us in these areas. I've told Senator Perry that improvements in unemployment insurance and workmen's compensation were our two priority items in this upcoming session, or the session that's uh, going on now. I further told him that we'd like to get an audience with Finch sometime after he takes office, and had a little time, to go into some other matters with him. One of them is the State Department of Labor, we want to find out exactly what it is he wants to try to do. Now, does, any, does the board agree with this priority business pretty well that unemployment work must comp is our priority items in this session? Of course, there'll be other matters before the legislature we have an interest in. That in that workman's comp, I'd say choice of doctors. Is choice, well, I'm talking about improvements yeah. in workman's comp, and that's one of them, right. Yeah. Uh, Doug Abraham is supposed to be working on some legislation. Uh, Ted Millett's already pre-filed a bill. It ain't what we want, but there has been some bills pre-filed. I'll tell you what, uh, uh, I think Ted's going to come out with something because Ed Lowe and myself had him over in Ed's office one day, <coughs> and we didn't talk nasty to him. We just talked mean as hell to him. Well, it, it showed I mean, up we up here the other day right when I, I mean, we too told him how it was and went out and endorsed another person against him and come close to beating him. And then he had a Republican run against him. Uh, we had to come back and get on him. Get, get him. <laughs> yeah, but we straightened him up. <laughs> One other item that we need to discuss with you before we, uh, Tom and I have to leave, we're making good progress too, I think, unless some of y'all got a uh, number of things that we need to dispose of. We're just about care of the items that we need some action on. We've, uh, we've, we've met with the people that uh, <coughs> we got the contract with the contract with on the tie program just this past week. And uh, Tom wants to kind of review with you that program, some things in the making and so forth. Well, <coughs> we'll make it short. Uh, as you know, we've been concerned about getting additional outlets for this tire program. Here's what the deal is. It looks like we're making a little progress. This guy Hooker, Russell, that you talked to, yeah. called me. <clears throat> he was very cool. This guy, for the benefit of those of you who don't know who you're talking about, is the lead tire dealer <clears throat> along the coast. All he's got all of the coast. In addition to his own stores, there's a number of tire stores that buy the merchandise from him. He gets his out of Mobile. So he came up the other day changed his mind about, I guess he got to looking at some potential down there. So he came up the other day and he and the guys here in Jackson at Lee Tire, Anglin Tire it is now, here in Jackson came out. Here's what the deal is. <coughs> he has now said that he's willing to sign a contract with them and open all of his stores along the coast. And he is now in the process of contacting about five, he's got about six stores of his own, six outlets that he either owns a part or all of them. His name may not be on it, but he's the top cat. In addition to those six or seven, he's got about five other dealers that buy merchandise from him. He is now in the process of contacting them to see if they'll participate. Now, if they will, to make a long story short, 
will cover the entire southern portion of Mississippi fairly well. Uh, there'll be a dealer in Hattiesburg and maybe one in Pebble, you know, oh. if, he, if he brings this off. Yeah. Now, the, the only problem that we'll have will be opening <coughs> four dealers in North Mississippi. We've got Columbus. That's the only one. We're, we're going to, uh, of course, we've got to negotiate a new contract. Now, here's what we've said to, to, to uh, Bird C and Van Anglin here, that we'd like to have an addition to Columbus. We'd like to have one maybe in Grenada, maybe one in Greenville, or somewhere like that. We need one in Meridian. So here's the deal. We're in the process of negotiating a new contract. Well, now, there's going to be a, a small increase in the price because tires have gone up three times since we signed this contract we are under now, and they've absorbed the whole thing. So uh, Bert called me this morning, Claude, after you left, as I was coming out the door, they got me, and I went back inside. He is preparing the new <coughs> list the, the retail price as uh, you know and showing our price based on what he told me on the phone you'd be up Monday morning with it in writing the, the prices uh, the average price is going to be about two dollars a ton and when you think about you know everything else where it goes up this is still a good price it might be one or two classifications that jump by two dollars and a half but if we accept this it's going to go to the press we're going to do a brand new brochure and hopefully we'll have the name and address of all of the new outlets on this brochure. And the, the cards, of course, we've got to come out with new identification cards. The ones we're using now are going to expire on December 31st. So that, hopefully, if we, I don't know if we're going to have any additional outlets for North Mississippi to, in time to get them on the brochure, but we are working on it. Uh, the, the program is, uh, is picking up support all along. They're even mailing quite a few tires now, or shipping them by way of first one mm -hmm. uh, carrier and the other that people are ordering on the telephone. It's really surprising. I didn't think this would really come through, but apparently it has. And the prices are just, you know, second to none, really. So it looks like we're going to be able to expand the program considerably, and hopefully before, uh, by convention time, We'll house some other outlets in North Mississippi, and it'll be fairly convenient to our members throughout the state. Yeah, I didn't know if that guy had ever called you not to. Oh, well, when he called me, <coughs> Russell, uh, he had picked up a brochure somewhere, and, and I told him, you know, what he wanted to do was sign a contract with her for something more than what I said, look, friend, we got <coughs> one price. If you want to sign this contract, we'll talk. If you don't, we won't. In other words, what he was saying and wasn't really saying was, I'm the lead tire dealer along the coast. I'd like to see you break in and take my business. See? Well, we was just a fixing to do that very thing. We was fixing to take his darn business on the coast away from him. He yeah, must he, have had a dream about it. He called me up and in the he called me up and started telling me where all his stores is located at. And he said I'd like to sign an agreement for you. And I said, Well. First of all, I don't cut no backroom deals. I'll give you the name of the man that's in charge, and y'all get it worked out fine. Look, you know, I'm not going to come to your price. I've got a good price. I've got a discount price. I'd like to see you take my business away from me all along the coast. Well, we, I, we've been talking to, to Anglin and see, and we was just fixing to do that very darn thing. Well, I guess he had a, a nightmare one night, got up and called them and said, I want to come to Jackson and get in on that program. Tom, Tom may I ask <coughs> something yes. you, while you're talking with him? and I know him pretty well. <laughs> uh, I wonder, after this price increase, I just wonder how we'll compare up in my part of the state. You know, we're not far from Alabama with Alabama price. Well, as a matter of fact, the base now, we haven't got this from Barney Weeks, you see, but if you remember, their program and ours was the same. Yes. See, yes. we've even got one or two Alabama stores for the benefit yeah. of people up uh -huh. there. But the, 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 the words we get is that Jones over there that they're dealing with has already, they've already, them in Alabama's already gone up. They're even above us now. They're paying more money for the same tire right now than we are. I understood that. See? I understood that. And I just wondered with the raise that he, he is asking for, how would. I'd love to know they how we're going to come out with them if, 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 if you finish, Curtis. Okay. Okay. As long as right. 
I assume that it's all right for the board for Tom and I to do the best we can <coughs> for this program and get the additional outlets and the best we can on the price. Let me ask yeah. one thing before we do adjourn. Yeah. Don't take, I don't think, but a couple of minutes. And I'm kind of like Will Rogers. All I know is what I read in the papers. But I read in the papers that under the existing law, 15 people have been registered as lobbyists this in this present, uh, for this purposes of uh, uh, influencing legislation in <laughs> this uh, new administration. And um, I wonder to what extent we would think of uh, our president as being a lobbyist if he comes under that requirement or doesn't come under that requirement. There's some uh, situations that determine whether you do or not, namely, I believe, as to whether or not you're on salary exclusive uh, or maybe jointly. Would you respond for about a minute on <coughs> that? Yeah, well, <coughs> I guess we'll have to, I'll have to deal with it, and I've, uh, of course, dealt with it in various and sundry ways down through the years. Uh, I <coughs> have registered on occasions, on occasions I haven't. Uh, the uh, a certain group of people in the state uh, started to make an issue over the fact that certain people that they considered lobbyists were not uh, registered. Uh, so I registered and then uh, started to check around on various and sundry people that, that were not registered, was doing a hell of a lot more lobbying, spent a lot more money than I wasn't. And to make a long story short, I <coughs> finally wrote a letter to a district attorney in this, uh, this county that had called my attention to the fact that I hadn't filed the proper reports, advised that gentleman that uh, under section so and so of the law that I didn't feel that I had uh, needed to file the reports because we hadn't spent any money uh, in, uh, in this area of influencing legislation. I called their hand is what it did. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> I think perhaps what we need to do that perhaps I need to register as a lobbyist and just be registered just in case something comes up that we might need to spend a little money, maybe get some folks together and uh, wine them and dine them, yes, uh, where there's some proof that I've actually done this. <coughs> and I spend some money, you know, I feed a few people, I buy a few drinks and that kind of stuff, just being nice, but not directly related into any particular piece of legislation. But as I view it, under the Mississippi statutes that's presently on the books, uh, my activity cannot be construed as uh, being in violation of the lobbying law unless we go out and spend some money trying to influence somebody on a specific piece of legislation. Uh, you know, we're going to have to deal with it, uh, I guess. Now, the so-called ethics bill, that we got killed in the committee the last time uh, was a humdinger, as all of you know. And let's be honest about it, the people pushing that is trying to set up a situation to make it virtually impossible for us to do our job. Uh, out here politically, helping to elect people and then trying to exercise some influence in the, in the legislature. I don't know if I've answered your question or not, uh, uh, Marvin. But I, uh, I guess I'm lucky so far not to have been put in jail. Well, there wouldn't be any liability particularly no. the fact that you no. do register. Right. But no. it does would clearly. I think so. Uh, I think I think that perhaps I'll register and I, perhaps I'll get down or I'll register anybody working with us and then decide at the end of the session whether or not we've done anything requiring a report, disclosure and expenditure of money. Now, what the MEC would like for us to do is to file a detailed report on all of the money we spent in the elections and in the legislature and the whole thing so they can take that and beat us over the head with it like you're talking about the financial state. But they don't file one showing what all they do. No. <laughs> right. <laughs> but that's the crowd that's behind it. They did register a guy this last time. <coughs> now let me tell you one, I'm glad you raised this subject because we had something happen the other day that, uh, <coughs> that I, I meant to report to you. 
And that's the fact that this cat, this lawyer that had me sued for $100,000, you remember the board went on record here sometime <coughs> back, uh, uh, backing me up in terms of not making any out-of-court settlement, and I told the lawyer, of course, to tell them they wasn't getting a damn nickel. Well, last month, the, the judge dismissed the case yeah. because they wouldn't go to trial with it. Oh, we yeah. insisted on a jewel trial. So that case has been dismissed, and we're not uh, under the gun on that one anymore. Just one of these things, Marvin, you have to make judgments on from time <coughs> to time, but I intend to register with the Secretary of State. I intend to take down Ori over and get him registered, just in case we get into a situation where we have to perhaps spend a little money and perhaps have to file a report. That'll be the only reason. I intend to do that if that's what the board thinks I need to do, of course. I realize it's about time for you to leave, but uh, are you going to be around the office or back here sometime later this afternoon? Yeah, right. We can. I've got a guy coming from our local that's pretty well heading up the program, but we've started a new problem employee assistance program in our plant. Problem. And I'd like to talk to you about it we, right. together. All right, and, this is the situation. Really, I would have liked to have got him before this board and discussed yeah. the whole matter. I know, yeah. uh, well, even like James, we've all, in order for our plants to compete and stay in business, we've got to provide these companies with some kind of something to keep them up where they can compete with these little non-union plants. And, and I think this program is really going to help our plan. I know already we've only had it some three or four months, and we've had some employees that's been in pitiful shape that all we've got to do is pick up the telephone if he's an alcoholic and get him in up in Memphis. We can't get him in Mississippi. We've got to go to Memphis. And I think we need to do some work in this area. <coughs> We've got a we program we're trying to get in here with the, tied in with the Appalachian Council. We, we've been doing a little of that in our West Point local, and we've what time been working with that center over I'm sure he's time. already here. We but ought to be through down you know. here by 3.30. Why don't you bring him to the office and be there about 4 o'clock? All right. I say office because Tom and I have got to go back down there. Well, I mean, that's, that's the reason I asked you. Now, all of y'all are invited to come to the Holiday Inn thing and meet with the IUE people. They... Paul Jennings and what have you. This afternoon, if you'd like to come down, that's a downtown holiday. Phone All of any of you want to come is invited. Now, tomorrow morning, Mary, tomorrow morning we're going to have to make arrangements for a few people to be out here to register the people no, come just, to the meeting. Just keep the change for the game. We simply want to try to get two bucks a piece out of as many people as we can and sell them a coat ticket and get the names and addresses of everybody here. So if you could, and help us maybe get one or two more folks to help rest them on a sheet of paper and sell them a coat ticket, Tom will have the, the bag. That's all we're going to do. Could I get in on my VIP? That's to the office as to whether or not there were uh, violations of the contract. <coughs> Barney told me about a week or ten days ago that all of the farmers and I, we've been doing some checking and found that to be true here. Other than some old retired pharmacists who don't feel about getting out of the yard, let alone out of town, the pharmacists are all at work. Other than their regular hours, they work over here at night and over there on the weekend. You can't hire one for love or money. There's two or three here that we can hire, but you couldn't get them out of town if, if you wanted them out of town. So here's what we're down to. We don't have the funds in this treasury, as you can readily see, to hire one if we can find it to audit this program. And sooner or later, we might let this letter lay on the desk for a month or so, but sooner or later, he's going to call or he's going to write another letter. He's going to insist on... On this price schedule, if we give it to him, we've got to give it to the other drug stores. And what I'm saying to you right now, there's more and more discount drug stores. All of the corner drug stores are going to discount drug stores. Mm -hmm. Is that we just about come to the end of our way on this drug program as we know it. I Tom, I just want to comment. I'll tell you what I'm finding, uh, even with the old program before they changed it. I've been right buying the same drug about six years prior to when the program was in effect. 
And what you get into, when we agree to that Red Book price, he was already selling me the drug I'd been getting for six years because I happened to already be a customer of the drugstore we got a contract with. He sells it to me cheaper than the Red Book price. If I went by a program, he charged me more for it than he did for what I was getting it started. He violated the contract right there. He said, or whenever less. See? Well, but, but Anderson, the guy me and you met I with, know Gibson. I know it. He saw me getting a prescription, and, and I questioned the price of it. He asked me to come in the back, and he said, Now, what I agreed to you fellas with was a red book price. Now, I've been letting you have it cheaper than that, so if I go for the deal I got between me and you, I'll charge you more, but I'm going to keep charging you that old price, so I'm getting my drugs the same price I've been getting them. See? <laughs> well, now, uh, our folks are not benefiting this program. We need to know about it, because it's taking a lot of time, and it's costing a lot of money to police it, and then it's not properly policed. And I agree with what Brother Tucker said. You know, we got more important things to do as far as time's concerned. We need to know about it. If the program's not helping people, then I'm for cutting it out. Because the only time it helps people, and I, I want to say this, it did in the beginning. It says trading was an independent drugstore, yeah. and then started to trade with a discount. Right. But they could have got it at that same price at that discount store if it had been going there all the time. All we doing is hurting them from business. Is that all we're doing? <laughs> That's all, all. we're doing. Yeah. Well, and then, too, you see, I've had, I've had this situation where the man here was the, 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 the medicine when it was on the house. Uh, I find out that medicine is taken over. The manager called me. I, I go to the Ellis Avenue store here, and I was out there, and he, all of them know me personally. And he called me back that one day. Matter of fact, I've been on him about some phone calls I got. Some of the members were dissatisfied. I've been on him, and he called me back to back. He said, now, here's the problem. He called the name of the area manager who has since left the company since Medisave bought it out. And he says, what was happening here? He says, this guy was actually going below your schedule of price. And he says, I have been instructed to strictly follow that schedule. And he says, consequently, there's a few different tie, and that's the reason so many people raise their hand. So that's why we got with this particular. But the reason we did it to start with was in hopes that we could save some people a few pennies. That's all it was. And there's more, like I said, there's very few corner drug stores left. They're moving, they're leaving downtown, and when they get out in the shopping center, it's the same it's crowd, discount. but it's a discount. It's a discount. So, I mean, this, this puts the icing on the cake right here. You know, they are pressuring me. Well, some of them fees is more than double, and he starts from well, zero up to a dollar. In other words, if you get a 50 cent prescription, he's going to add another 50 cent and charge you a dollar. He, he's in his own life. We can't provide him nothing with it. <laughs> nothing but. <laughs> well, they're pressuring the pharmacies to advertise their prices anyway now. If they yeah. get something done on that, they're it's what they're, yeah. they're being pressured to advertise yeah. their prices. Yeah, there was a suit, you know. Oh. The lawsuit. Somebody brought yeah. the, somebody brought the pharmacy board. The pharmacy brought suit against in right. Super D and found yeah. out that yeah. you know they couldn't do anything about that. So that that's the situation. And, like I say, the only way we could continue, right. even if we hadn't had this proposal for new rates, would have been to have them audited, see? And uh, we ain't got that kind of money. Well, I wonder if we could get a motion from the board to put this matter in the hands of the executive committee for further study. I would be reluctant to cancel the program out without getting into it a little deeper follow this approach, then we can have a meeting with the executive committee. If it looks like at that point that we'd all be better off to cancel that program out, we will. But I, I don't think we have enough information to take that kind of action here today, but it is concerning me because we wasted an awful lot of time, and I don't think our folks are benefiting all that much from this thing out there. We've got other things that's more important, in my opinion. Can the I get a motion to that effect? Put this matter concerning the drug program into the hands of the executive committee for further study and perhaps a recommendation back to the next board meeting. So moved. We get a second to that motion. I second. 
All in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion can't sort it. I wanted to get that out of the way. We got several other items to take up before we get into the recommendations for the convention. Uh, well, maybe you step out there and, and uh, <clears throat> tell them to get it on in here as soon as they can. We'll get you with a break. We've got several things that I'd like to dispose of to get out of the way before we get into this important matter of what we're going to recommend for the convention, okay? Now, we've talked a little bit about the convention, agreed to the date. <coughs> now, the legislature is going to be in session. I assume that you're going to want a banquet for the legislature, the government, and everybody out like we did four years ago. Now, of course, we'll try to work towards that direction. Now, thoughts occurred to me. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, a lot of our people have never been to the state capitol. A lot of them never been around when the legislature was in session. It appears to me that instead of a three-day convention this time, we might ought to think about a four-day convention. Uh, and we'll take out part of a part of a day or something uh, for a day to visit the governor's mansion and the legislature and things like that. Uh, uh, we've talked about uh, here a couple of times in the past about rearranging things. We run a week for most folks anyhow for the convention. While we got him in here, let's get him over and let him visit the capital, meet members of the legislature and things of that kind. Let me throw that out for a few well, minutes. Before anybody else speaks, I'm opposed to it on the basis of cost. Cost? Uh, it, get it a three-day convention yeah. almost killed us, and if you had another day and not as many folks as I have to bring in here, four days lost time and traveling expenses, I don't know. I'd be I'd be more in favor of cutting down on some of the speakers. It's not that important, and right. doing the convention business and going home. Well, we can do it that way. Personally, you'd rather hold it to three days. I believe so, Paul, because you had another whole day's uh, meals and a whole day's lost time, and another whole day's lodging. Yeah. To every delegate, you sure are kicking up the cost of that <clears> thing. So you want to start on Monday and try to wind it like we have one at the end of Wednesday. Well, that's, that, that's my opinion. The rest of them can express their own. I think it was a good idea, and I think it would be it would be good for the labor image. It, yeah. it, we could do this, but there is again, like you said, expense. Mike can work it out where we can have part of the day to do this anyhow. Well, yeah, I'll work on it. How many hours is it? How many hours do the different speakers take up all the time? You went through and checked that. No, but I know one thing. We're going to have to cut out on the number of speakers compared to where we were last time. We, Amen. We had too many speakers <laughs> last time. Yeah. Well, so I, I got, you I got, got one of the wireless They speak two hours, and you've heard it four times before, so you right. get a little against the grain. So. I thought we might try to get Hubert Humphrey down here with us, but I think he's going to be the next Democratic nominee. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody got any objection to inviting Hubert? No, I vote for the man. My will, sir. I think he's the best qualified man. I thought we'd try to get one of the prominent presidential candidates. I don't think you can get very Cuba many people from Mississippi to go along well, with you. Well, they'll do like one. Well, they, they don't go along with you on both things, but that's my opinion, Howard. You right? Well, I'll tell you what, then, based on what Brother Jackson says, we'll go ahead and plan the thing for three days like we have. I understand that. I still think it would be good to throw it out for your consideration. Now, let's talk a little bit about <laughs> constitutional amendments for capital increase and things of that kind. Okay. Now you see why, don't you? <laughs> Well, I thought it was appropriate, appropriate time. Right. Now they'll see why I was opposed to a four-day convention. Anything that's going to add cost, I'm going to have to be opposed. Well, let's talk about the for capital thing as a starter. And I think that perhaps we, instead of trying to work on the Constitution and coming up with proposed amendments in this session of the board, that perhaps we ought to schedule a board meeting shortly after the 1st of January which time we'll have time to adopt them and submit them and send them out to locals anyhow, if that needs your approval. Uh, but we definitely are going to have to go for a per capita increase of some kind in this convention. We just, you know, the cost is eating us up, and we just can't continue the way we're going, gentlemen. It's, it's very obvious to me. The 
question now, I think, the big question is how much? So that question of how much is what I'm going to put before you right now. Is that a 15 cents you think, something like that? <laughs> <laughs> That's less than what we're paying. Isn't it? How much is that? Twenty cents. Is that, was that a year? No, if that's a year. Was that a year? You talking about? Twenty cents a member a month. Lowest to the south. It's right. It's the lowest. I mean, there's several in there. Several others is lowest. They the wait. Yeah. And of course, it's been a number of years since we. We increased it, but that's really stuff. not the point. The point is that this inflation and everything is eating us up. Everything that we do uh, is, is, is costing more now. Of course, I think the fact that we're going to get a little extra help out of the industrial union department is going to help us some on the salary situation of our third girl. But we have got to have we have got to have more money to run this organization on that. You know. You've got to. Uh, what about a nickel, James? Can you can your group? Well, you got the lowest wage group in the in the whole thing, and we all have to think about your situation. Well, I, I have can you support a nickel? I have delayed this thing a couple of times. I ain't gonna oppose a nickel. I don't know where in the hell I'll get it, uh, frankly. But we will try. It. That's all I can tell you. We got another fifty cents in per capita that has to go start our international next year, and there's no way I can raise dues. We start another 50 cents this year at the International. It's not the problem of this group that our International has got financial problems. But we got to pick up another 50 cents a member a month next September without any increase in dues. And I'll, if, uh, if there may be another nickel or somewhere, I'll try. That's all I can say if that's the will of the committee. Is anybody present here think that have trouble with a nickel increase? Everybody's got I less income. See, this is a problem. Pardon. I've got 30 percent left. The Constitution allow you to add that. Huh? I'm asking Jack Lee. The Constitution would allow him to add that 50 cents to them too. No, we don't. We, we read it out. We we can't. Uh, well, we we've not increased them as much as our people can stand. We'll be paying seven dollars a month. So. Yeah. I figure the first of November we'd be paying better than labor. We got. Uh, yeah, And uh, now James said that he that he wouldn't pose an nickel increase. He'd do his best to try to come up with that kind of money. Does anybody else have a problem here supporting a nickel increase in for capital? <coughs> well, I don't have a problem supporting it, uh, and I would if the convention voted that way. But I've got uh, financial problems in my home, local, serious problems. But I've had 30% reduction of membership, and uh, that was 30% of my income that went with it. And it don't look like it's going to be picking up anytime soon. So and we'd have to uh, hustle up a nickel, you know, if we couldn't raise the dues right now. Right. And I just wonder how many other locals would be in that same uh, shape. Instead well, of we've got quite a few that they're, out. they're in that same shape. Uh, Plus, when you when you talk about this, you have to wonder what what is going to do the overall situation. Yeah. Now, if the employment thing improves, and if we get a few locals affiliated, that I'm inclined to think that we will in the next uh, few months or weeks, then that's going to help some. Uh, the total the total affiliation is off about three thousand. We is up to about forty. 42,000 the last time we compiled the quarterly standing. 39. And that quarterly man. standing now, we're back to. 39 something, I We're back to 39 something. And of course, our, our ability to pick up additional costs in this organization 39. for a number of years has been around <coughs> the growth factor. The fact that we've been picking up additional unions and therefore additional revenue is what allowed us to get as far as we are. 
Well, with the cost of everything going up, and we're going to get another increase on mailing again before long. Yeah. First week had a Christmas regular. First week we have one Thursday. This is a real high cost item for this organization. Yeah, I mean, mailing. That no, that's going to be regular mail costs. You know what it costs us now just to do a mailing to the officers of the local union? I just do, the mail. I do. I get in the same thing. First class, seventy-eight dollars. That's what it's costing now to do one mailing to the officers of the local union. It's now ten cents a quilt. That's just the post. Well, I'm talking about just the post. paper and you yeah. your labor. <laughs> just for the, the two officers on the mailing list. That's the reason I, I asked to raise a question about an additional full-time employee. Right. Of course, if we well, need them, we've got to have them. I know what that is. You know, the thing that. about cutting some of his fringes and saying, I'll take. <laughs> five hundred dollars a month will well, not pay us. We ought to practice. Five hundred dollars a month is going to is is going to permit us to put the girl on full time. Now, you know we've I've tried to do a little figuring on that. To say we will about break even with the five hundred dollars to what we've been putting out for part time help. So we're not talking about an additional increase out here in cost as far as the three girls. And that's taken care of with that $500 a month. Unless they get into hard negotiations, though. Claude, let me just make a comment. I don't, yeah, I don't want to take my much time. Now they in trouble, <laughs> but I'll give you a picture of what's happening to us right now. In the yeah. first seven months of this year, our statewide organization that I'm supposed to head had a $2,000 deficit on our operation. And Besides the Oklahoma situation where we lost over 500 members at one clip and we hadn't had them since February, a few, they worked about 10 people into April. We have also had the reduction in membership in practically every local union across the state. So right now we're about 1,000 members below what we was this time a year ago. Yeah. Now I hope to God that changes. Yeah. Because if it don't, you know, we headed for, for a rocky road. And we got several unions in that same production, just like yours. It's a problem, but uh, you know, I don't know how we're going to continue to do it. And there's one <laughs> local you got listed on here that won't be listed on here after the next report. Aberdeen, we was officially, will be when the ballots is counted, about two days officially certified, but decertified, decertified. Okay. Okay. So we, we have lost that local union, in my opinion, and it won't be on the next report. Well, Not be, many, but it's that many. I'll be getting into another local, I think, we're going to affiliate here. If we've had the coffee break, and I'll tell you why. And I mean, I can't get to go over this with Tom, so he's going to learn about this with the rest of us. There's one thing that we've been kicking around in the office a little bit that would perhaps help some, and that's the fact that in a lot of the appeal that we've been printing in that office is that <coughs> we go in the hole every time we do a printing job, and if we might ought to give some thought to making some adjustments. That. You do an yeah. awful lot of that. Look at and if you want yeah. to uh, simply refer to that to us and let us see what kind of adjustments we can make on it, we will. We've got a list that Ms. Phillips has proposed uh, schedule on uh, spelling out so much for so many sheets and all that yeah. stuff. But this has been kind of a service that we provided to the affiliate. And, you know, in all fairness to everybody from the Jackson area, some of you benefited by it more than others. Right. But the local unions in the Jackson area get a hell of a lot more out of being affiliated with this organization than the locals do on the other end of the state. But we prepare <coughs> mailings for them, we do a lot of printing for them, and all that stuff, and all we charge them is actual cost. And it might well be that we ought to start thinking about adjusting that cost a little bit to take care of the cost of the labor involved and things of that kind. If you don't call it adjust it for the labor and your overhead, then we're paying for it. Right. The most state organizations, they laugh when we make them in the door. You know, I have to tell these nothing about it. We ain't about to start that. Well, the thing about it, though, it's been, an, it's been something that's helped build up the affiliation when you provide these services. Of course, when we put in the mailing system, you know, we've told everybody that we'd prepare a mailing form if they'd give us the time to get the mailing list in. Well, now, we, we do something for you once in a while, Brother Tucker from Marie. You get it over and you give us a little time. Some of the rest of you do the same thing, you know. But the same token, some of the other unions, like Jackson's outfit, people like that, they never, 
they take care of their own we and never, we, we never benefit from this service. Uh, but I think that perhaps if you want us to, if you want to, uh, let's do this by motion. If you agree with the thought, uh, let's put a motion out here that Brother Knight and myself take a look at the cost of printing and what have you for this service. You get a motion on that? I'll make that motion. I'll second. Any discussion? Yeah, Claude, I'd like to raise one question. Right now, do you say you charge the local union the actual cost like the paper? Just the paper. And if we do a mailing, just the postage. Well, let me ask you this. It's not being, you know, in total opposition to it. If a local union pays 20 cents per month per month for capital tax, and uh, we're discussing an increase here now to possibility of 25 cents, and uh, then you turn around and charge them more than actual cost to do something for Why are the locals paying for capital tax? Well, what he's saying, Woodson, is there's about 10 in the state, and nine of them say it's in the city of Jackson. You can just serve it. Well, I mean, I'm just saying actual cost. If you no, we're not, just, we're not even charging for the plate material, so the chemicals, the heat, and everything else. And, yeah. and, and this cost. will be going yeah. in the hole. Oh, well, that, that, that's no problem when you increase it to that actual cost. To the actual, oh, we've got to charge the paper. Yeah. And and what I'm talking about, if home. you go above what it actually It ain't going to be no whole lot. It ain't going to cost you over a couple They're not dollars. talking about Brother Woodson going above the actual cost. They just been, hadn't, hadn't, hadn't been, been included the actual cost. They didn't include all this stuff then. I don't think... I don't think you ought to go over actual cost, no. but you ought to include everything. Everything. Yeah. Or to get the cost. All right, it's not going to. It ain't going to cost you all that much. But we, we'll take a look at it. I'm not losing money on that. We didn't vote on that motion. Any further discussion? All in favor of the motion signified by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried and sorted. One more thing. And I want to take up with you before we break for coffee and we come back after coffee break, we're getting into the main business of the Coke Convention. Well, before you leave yeah. the affiliation, I'd just like to make just a couple of comments. And I'm not criticizing anybody at this table. And I don't want to be in a position of always talking now in progress. I'm not. And I want to point out that we happen to be one of the few organizations that does affiliate all our members. We, we pay all your members. 20 cents a member on every member we got based on a dues check off as published by the company they work for on a monthly basis. So if we got 500 members in that local that month, they pay 500. We pay on 500. And the minute a local union is affiliated or we charter one, it's affiliated the following month, and that's done by my office, and we pay based on the members that we collect from. If we could get that in some more organizations, we wouldn't have this financial problem. I problems. agree with you. I'm in complete Even though I've had to be opposed at times to per capita increases and at times to cost items, we don't short the council on our membership, and we'll pay that our last dollar is gone, and we'll continue to do that, and I just want to make this point. Well, I appreciate it, James, myself, and I'm sure everybody else here does, and it's just a crying shame that the entire labor movement doesn't take the same attitude. <coughs> if we had everybody in this state affiliated and get 20 cents a month a month out of them, we wouldn't be having to talk about a nickel increase. Is it really that simple? We have as little as money as these colonists think we got in these politics. <laughs> but Tom Knight and myself, and I guess a few of the rest of you, but I know that Tom and myself, we spend one hell of a lot of time running around this country, meeting the local unions, trying to convince them to affiliate with the organization. Just last month, I drove all the way to Ripley, Mississippi. The few days before that, he drove all the way to Fulton, Mississippi, met with a new local union, talked to them about affiliating with this organization. We got them both affiliated. But the fact is, you see, we're having to spend a hell of a lot of our time that we could be putting in on something else of value out here and getting people into the organization when this ought to be automatic. And if everybody had your attitude, it'd be automatic. Well, I don't even leave it to the local unions to pay it. That's the reason I pay I it. I don't know. If, if you're talking about yeah, the one in Ripley, it would have been if you had made the, <laughs> the right calls because our Constitution calls for them to yeah. affiliate. Well, they come on through. I noticed it was on there. Right. right. And this other money group in Fulton is still working. <laughs> well, there's one other thing, then we'll try to break for coffee. 
I'd like to get this one out of the way before we break. You know, we're, we're headed into the bicentennial celebration of the founding of this nation. Next year will be it. I'm thinking at this time that perhaps we ought to put on a special Labor Day program next year of some kind. Anybody got any thought on this? I think so. I think, no, we there's several different things that I think we can think about doing. Some of the states have put on expositions with a parade that lasts about uh, two or three days, put on an exposition. We might rent the, uh, one of the buildings down here, put on a display, and then on Labor Day have a statewide parade type thing. This is what I'm thinking. But we ought to do something as the labor movement in this state in celebration of the founding of this country next year. I, I feel pretty strong about this. Well, I spent a little money this last Labor Day. Right. I don't know if anybody else in Labor did, but I paid for a radio program that was sort of a canned program of tapes, giving the history of all the outstanding labor leaders in this country back over all the years, and it cost me a couple hundred dollars, and it was run three days. And it's just two or three second spots, but you know, it told about Samuel Gompers and everybody right on up. And it was a real good program. I got a real good reception from my members on it. And it was a Labor Day program run by WHSY in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And they're going to finally provide me a tape of all of that, and I'll uh, let, you, let you run it so you can see what's on it. Uh, supposed to run a tape and give it to all the people. Mm -hmm. What do y'all think about the idea? About the state if of LCR are trying to do something special next year. You could put it this matter again in the hands of the executive committee and let us kick it around and see what we would like to present to you at that tax board meeting around the early part of January. What's your thoughts on it? We can put Jim Touchstone and Dan Ori in charge of it. Sure. Sounds like a good idea. Lead the parade, one of them be the rear guard. <laughs> <laughs> I really think we need to do something like this. Though. Yeah, some years ago, Labor used to have a parade on Labor Day. Uh, well, we used to have them in Jackson County, and then the units wore off. And when I was back, when I was president of my local back in the 50s, we used to have an annual Labor Day parade in Jackson County. It was all yeah, But I think because of the bicentennial thing in the history of this country, so. you know, that perhaps we ought to think in terms of a statewide program and perhaps bring everybody in and have a parade, a statewide type situation here in Jackson. That's what I'm thinking. Labor right. certainly ought to be a part Somebody of got the celebration of 200 years of the birth of the country. Somebody got some other ideas, I'm ready to listen, but I think we need to do something of special nature next year. <laughs> that wasn't what he said. <laughs> that was what he said. the motion that this might have been considered by the executive committee to make a, where well, they understand we make a recommendation <laughs> to the board. Uh, you, you ain't going to get it out of me, Joe. You just well, make a motion. Well, I have to do it. Yeah. RL made a motion, I'll second it. <laughs> And we no, put I this in the hands of the executive committee. You're, you're sticking yourself with it. He said executive committee. Yeah, but now wait a minute. I shouldn't He's make the motion. We're going to make a plan. Well, I didn't make it. <laughs> the executive committee will formulate a plan to present to the next meeting of this board there departing next January. If that motion is adopted. I think the executive committee ought to I, start to go along with mine. Any discussion on that motion? Not all in favor of the motion, click and fight to say an aye. Uh, uh, motion carried and so on. I understand the coffee's here. We can now break for the coffee if you'd yeah, like to stretch a little bit. On. He said he had I'm to talk make a phone call. call. Well, yeah. you've got a stack of stuff in front of you that we put out <laughs> before the meeting started. One of them for the tail wag the dog. One of them is a letter to Robert Georgine, the president of the Building Trades Department. 
I mean, Justice Court said he can't try nothing if he's interested in it. 
<laughs> He's interested in all them that's pigs. Right, that's right. He's in a stick. That's fine. <laughs> you don't get anything out of that fine, fellas. That's done been changed. Well, yeah, he gets five dollars. He gets four dollars per case. Five isn't it? for every charge. Every time he's trying to pay for his five dollars. Yeah. We got one in Williams that fills up the book every two weeks too. Every what? About every two weeks. About every two days. Is everybody <laughs> read the constitutional amendment? Ready. Are you ready for a discussion on the resolution? Who wants the floor first? Resolution is rather simple to the point. I'm talking about our resolution. You move the adoption of the resolution? Right. Okay, and a second? That's a second. Any discussion on that motion? Right, all in favor of the motion signify to say an aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried and so on. Well, I appreciate that. At least we don't have to revise it. She's ready to go present, to present to the delegates now. Now, before we get into this, uh, Jim? Me? I want to talk about the date of the next board meeting before we break this thing up. And, uh, I'm out all the way now to Brother Jackson gets back to Miller Knight gets in here. Yeah. Well, he told me when he was Brother Knight. Yeah. He's talking about it. Yeah. Yeah. Get your calendars out and let's take a look at the, the 76 calendar. I don't have one. <laughs> you don't have a 76 calendar? Right there. there you go. <laughs> well, the... I've got one. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, it appears to me that the best time to have another board meeting, if we have it, say, on a weekend like we ordinarily do, would be perhaps uh, on the 10th of uh, January. It would be on a Saturday. You want it on a Friday, of course, it be on the 9th of January. Now, the legislature will be reconvening, a reconvening here, first session on January 6th. Uh, we're going to submit constitutional amendments, the board is. <coughs> we're going to have to act as soon as we can to get those things out to the affiliated membership because we have a limited amount of time to do that under the Constitution, as all of you know. That's the second Saturday. The yeah. second Saturday in January, right. And it's not going to snow that Saturday either. January the 10th. I can't make any promises about the snow. No, <laughs> Do we, can we have an agreement or understanding that we shoot for January the 10th for that board meeting? Is that a state objectionable to anybody? If well, not, then Saturday we're going to plan to have the next board meeting on January 10th. Okay. All right, we're going to now get into the major business at hand before. I'd like to uh, review with you before we have any discussion on the candidates we're going to recommend. I, I called the Secretary of State's office a few minutes ago. That's where, where I went when <coughs> Tom was taking up some of these other matters to check with them to see who had qualified as independents in the last couple of days. We want to make sure we had the latest information on this whole thing. I'm just going to start with the governor and come down. Present time, you have Cliff Finch, the Democratic nominee for governor, Carmichael, the Republican nominee, and Mr. Kirksey is an independent. <coughs> Lieutenant Governor, you've got uh, Evelyn Gannon, the Democratic nominee, and Bill Patrick, the mayor of law, the Republican nominee, and no independent. Secretary of State, you've got Heber Ladner, the Democratic nominee, and Tom Stewart, the Republican candidate, 
no independence. Then the general, you got A.F. Sumner, the Democratic nominee, and Toxie Hall Smith, the Republican nominee, no independence. State treasurer, Ed Pittman, Democratic nominee, Greg Jackson, the Republican nominee, no independence. Now keep in mind that September the 25th is the deadline for independence to qualify, so they, it's still time yet for some other people to qualify. That's the main reason I went out there, because I picked up a rumor about one or two going to qualify. Superintendent of Education, Charles Holliday is the Democratic nominee. D.J. Jetworth, an independent, no Republican. Uh, <coughs> Commission of Insurance. George Steele is the Democratic nominee, a Herbert McGuffey is a Republican nominee, and at this point, no independents qualified, but I heard on the news yesterday that an independent was, said he was qualified, and that was the primary purpose of that telephone call, but he hasn't qualified yet, an independent, the insurance man from Jackson. <coughs> and a land commissioner, Ellie Ainsworth, the Democratic nominee, and a Jerry D. E. Baker, a Republican, and Tom Marshall has wrote me a letter indicating he wants our support. He indicates he wants to run as an independent. Now, he hasn't yet qualified. He might be waiting to see what decisions we make or what recommendations we make back to him. I'll read that letter as soon as I get through all of it. And the Highway Commissioner, District, I, I, I tried to see what we had in terms of uh, the Highway Commissioners and uh, Public Service Commissioners. At the present time, there are no independents or Republicans running against either three Highway Commissioners. That's Pyron in the Southern District, Wagner in the Central District, and Richardson in the Northern District. We had heard that there's going to be an independent Republican running in one or two of these situations, but, but as of a few minutes ago, no one has yet qualified against the, the three people I just named on the Pro Highway Commission. Uh, and the Public Service Commission, a Republican by the name of Johnston, J-H-O-N-S-T-O-N, is running against Norman Johnson, J-H-O-N-S-O-N, the incumbent. Ooh. That's a Republican in Central Johnson. Public Johnson. Service Commission District. <laughs> the only difference in that, he's got a T in his name where Norman's got, don't have the T. He might, that might be a... Which one of them names will come first on the ballot? I believe Norman will come first because of that T. Yeah. Because of the D? Because of the T. I thought they list them by party instead of by... Uh, well, he would. That's right. It's in there. That's right. He would. Democrat would come ahead of the Republican. Right. So I don't know that similarity. Except in Hines County, they list them by alphabetical order now, since the uh, Republicans control the election commission. It started since they control the election. Commission. <laughs> yeah. it makes a difference. Yeah. Controlling the machines. Yeah. You know. And uh, let's see. Uh, Public Service Commission. We got uh, John Dale has got uh, an independent running against him in the Southern District by the name of Jay Welch, W L S W L C H. Now that's a new one. I didn't know that. I wonder if Keller's not here. Did anybody know that this guy had qualified against Dale? I didn't. I didn't know First about I heard it. Anyhow, George. Uh, John Dale, that is, the Commissioner, the Public Service Commissioner of the Southern District, will have an opponent this time around. And I've already mentioned the other thing to you. And that, and yeah, here's one. I overlooked Half King. He's got, uh, Half King is, is the uh, present auditor, the Democratic nominee. He's got Jack Amos, the, uh, a Republican, running against him. Now, Amos is the cat that pulled out of the treasurer's race was that only be one Republican in that race prior to our last convention. You might remember this. But Amos decided then to qualify against Hamp King, which meant that the Republicans were in free and they had no Republican primary in the statewide level. You got problems or information? You got them all? 
Well, I think I got it all. I told her shake it at state there a while ago. You did? Well, I didn't know you had been talking, so yeah. I got this from the office. Well, anyhow, I just went through this, and we got a couple of independents that qualified. <coughs> so, for instance, George Dale has got uh, an independent running against him. Um, and as of as of a few minutes ago, some of the one or two of these independents that have indicated they're going to qualify haven't qualified, including Tom Marshall. Now, let me read you Tom Marshall's letter, and then we'll open the whole thing up to consideration. This is dated August the 27th. He called me, I must say, and I advised him to write to the letter. Dear Claude, I'm entering the state land commissioner's race in the independence of the general election to be held November 4, 1975. The purpose, uh, purpose of this letter is to request labor's endorsement in this election. During the six years which I served as city commissioner for the city of Jackson, I received endorsement of labor and had a real good relationship with every local and every member that I came in contact with. If you will check your records, you will find that I have cooperated with labor in every instance and that, I, that I was called upon. And I enjoyed probably one of the best relationships with labor of any person serving is serving in public office. My aims and objectives as State Land Commission, Commissioner would be to research the possibilities of the office. And I'd like to work to either upgrade the work being performed in that department, or if it could not be improved upon, I would recommend to the state legislature that the office be abolished, the workload transferred to another state department. <coughs> I would bear, uh, value very highly your endorsement and the endorsement of labor throughout the state. And Trump can promise that if elected, I will cooperate with you and your group towards building a better Mississippi for all our working people. Looking forward to hearing from you and working with labor in this endeavor. Sincerely yours, Tom Marshall. Of course, those in Jackson know who Tom Marshall is. You can be on the city council. Most of you know him. And it might well be that he was going to wait to hear from us to get our views on him running the independent before he qualified. As I said, he hasn't yet qualified. Now, that's the situation, and you've got the information about those people that have qualified for <coughs> all the state districts. Positions as of about an hour ago. I wait one day. Uh, uh, Marshall, when he was the city commissioner, <coughs> our local union controlled the state curb and gutter sidewalk work. But after he got out of there, we lost all that. But he was, uh, he was a good friend. Ain't no question about that. What he's on the city council. Did you know that Ray Marshall was on? Now, how do you want to deal with this? Do you want to take them office by office? Or do you want to, yeah. How do you propose to do with it? You've got, you've got a couple of situations. I, it appears to me that by previous action, you pretty well endorsed Eber Latin and Evelyn Gandhi. Mr. Chairman, if I'm in order, I'd like to make a motion that we endorse all the Democratic nominees in the election and work for their election. For all the state uh, and district commissions. Yes. yes. Well, I'd certainly accept that. I'll, I'll second that motion. That's uh, one way of taking the whole issue <coughs> shebang up at one time. Are we having a discussion on that motion? Do we have any questions of Democrats on that? You know, a bad Democrat like you have a bad Republican. Are we lined up with the AFT on the superintendent of Nope. Motion would settle that question as well. If it passes. Yeah, I'd like to have a poll. Mr. Knight wants the poll. If I may, I'd like to speak on this motion. Say the same thing I said to Jackson Central by the meeting last Tuesday. I think when we start to take action at this time, we have to look beyond the elections in Mississippi this year. First of all, I'll ask you a question. Are you satisfied with what we've had in Washington for the last six years, seven years, 
under Richard Nixon and his blood child, Gerald Ford. And do you want four more years of that after <laughs> next year? Now that has a direct connection to this election right here. I recognize the motion that was made and second, and I agree with it. And somebody, I believe it was Brother Turner, who questioned something about some of the individual candidates. There's no doubt that some of the individual nominees, Brother Turner, don't stack up as individuals. I think you'd find this in any group of a half a dozen or less people that you've got uh, some that are, could be classified as lightweight, some maybe lukewarm, maybe not uh, some not quite so warm. But nevertheless, I think that, as I said, we have to look at this from a long-range point of view. I think the chickens are getting real close to the roosting place in this state. As I said, the cliff fence this morning. For 30 years, the Democratic Party has been headed down the road to hell as far as this state's concerned. We haven't had one single governor in this state, not one single governor, that had the guts and the gall and the audacity and the dedication and the commitment to the Democratic Party to stand up anytime, anywhere, under any circumstances and proclaim his allegiance to the Democratic Party without abusing that party by beginning to talk about the fact that he was a Mississippi Democrat. So my friends, the chickens are getting close to the roost. We, we, this, this party and this state has been, been disintegrating. It's been coming apart. It's a sin. Gil Carmichael's got a ready-made situation to step into here. And Bill Patrick and any other Republican stand as bad. I think that the nominees of the Democratic Party, from governor to J.P., have come to the place where they can no longer take a back seat, where they can no longer pass the buck, where they can no longer afford to talk about being a regular Democrat, a, a loyalist Democrat, or anything but a real, true Democrat. Brother, I think that no less than Gerald Ford will campaign in Mississippi before November the 4th. And we as individuals, most of us even know as an organization, are bipartisan. Most of us are Democrats because we recognize the fact that it had not it been for the Democratic Party and its program that we wouldn't be where we are today. In fact, some of us might have starved to death. So I simply say to you, my friends, as trade unionists and as citizens and taxpayers, as Americans and Mississippians, that the time has come, I think. And regardless of whether or not some of these Democrats individually may be just exactly what we would like for them to be, whether they measure up or not, whether they've got the guts and the gall to do their job or not. I think that unless we endorse here in this board meeting and in that committee meeting tomorrow and in that convention on Saturday anything less and work to elect, as Brother Tucker, I was glad you added that to that motion. Endorsement about that's not worth a damn, you know? I think if we do any less than endorse the Democratic ticket and leave him wholly and totally committed that we are then aiding and abetting another four years of Gerald Ford, and I'll swear we can't stand that. Thank you.
had another session with, uh, <coughs> with Mr. Finch. And I must tell you that I was well pleased with Finch's attitude, especially as it relates to the National Party support and the nominees of the party for president and the whole works. I was thrilled. Uh, well, as a matter of fact, I was just well pleased with his overall attitude in regards to everything that Tom talked about. Now, in answer to your question, uh, Brother Turner, looking the list over, uh, I assume you're thinking about all the statewide positions. Do we have any questionable Democrats? And, uh, looking that list over, I don't see one down there that I could question with any great sincerity. Uh, I really don't. <coughs> and, of course, we don't know too much about the Republicans that are running for the different positions with the exception of a couple. <coughs> we have made an effort to meet with, uh, with the nominee for, for Lieutenant Governor, Mr. Bill Patrick from Laurel, and we wasn't able to work anything out to meet with him. But otherwise, outside of Patrick, we have sat down and we've interviewed all of the candidates for all of these positions. The ones we haven't interviewed personally, for the lower positions, you've done it by mail. That's the best I can answer your question, brother. Is, is, yeah. it, is the mayor of Meridian running for some state? We're running against the Secretary of State. Didn't Labor endorse him when he ran for uh, mayor? They did this in, over. In that area. Yeah, they did this over uh, the famous Key, one of the famous Key brothers. It wasn't worth the salt that went in his bread as far as the mayor of Meridian was concerned. But yeah, I don't I, think. I As I remember right, just from memory, it was voted to put off until this this convention we're going to have Saturday. We had actually took no official action, and the action was postponed until the 13th of September, I believe, That's Brother Woodson. Right. Right. That point, right? That's the way I remember. Yeah. I, I do oh, remember. Goodness. I do remember in the uh, executive board meeting, in the committee meeting, the committee decided before they take a position on that, they would confer with the AFT. Uh, right. Now, are you saying that, that that this time you don't feel that you con should confer with them? on their position in regards to superintendent of education? Well, if you adopt this motion, that's what you're saying. The motion to support the nominees of the party. Of course, we've got another meeting to go through tomorrow. Betty Nelson has been invited to attend this meeting by virtue of the fact that she heads up a state organization, the AFT state organization. Uh, of course, she attended the last state COPE committee meeting. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I, if, I, if I may, I'd like to offer an amendment to that motion that uh, it excludes the superintendent of education at this, at this time. You want to amend the motion then that, uh, that the position of state superintendent be tabled for the time being? Is right. that what you want to do? Right. Uh, uh, we get a second to that? Yeah, okay. Mr. 
Chairman? On the amendment? Just discussion. Maybe it is on the amendment. Yeah, that's right. <clears throat> I was real disturbed with Betty Nelson, the action that they done at the convention. I really shouldn't have anything to say about it because I had left when this unanimous vote was made at the convention to eliminate Brad Dye as a contender for lieutenant governor. Now this scared the hell out of me, and the ladies may excuse me, because I, you, you just didn't know how close he come to being lieutenant governor. Right. Now when we pick out one segment of the labor movement <coughs> to have them uh, a choice of, of who they want elected, then I think we're getting away from the labor movement policy. This is just my feeling. I can't think we all perhaps share the responsibility to allow what you're talking about to happen, but we had just got through of a hassle over the State Insurance Commission, and it appeared from where Tom and I sit up at the front of the meeting that this seemed to be what a great majority of the delegates wanted, and therefore we didn't, we didn't fight it there on the convention floor. We could perhaps drawn it out and made a ding-dong battle out of it. I agree with your sentiments, and that was expressed from the board. <coughs> Nobody from the board uh, seemed to think it's worth making a fight over on the floor of that convention, Brother Tucker. That's, right. that's how right. this all happened. Yeah. Well, one other brief comment. My, my position is not that we commit one segment of the labor movement to do this. Of course, if, if this segment of the labor committee would elect to do it, then they got the right to do it. We can't stop it. The only thing I'm saying is that until we again confer with representatives of AFT on this, that we should not make a decision on it. You know, this is my opinion. Okay. Well, I understand your position. That's what your amendment says. For, for, practical, for purposes at this time, if your amendment passes, then... Well, did she say that they had, uh, their organization had conclusive Now this is a different yeah. ball game. Yes, we'll uh, we'll recognize our distinguished best to Mr. <laughs> Dan Powell. If the state council does not take a position in a race, any local union has a right to endorse who they want to. After the state council does not take a position, right. no city central body, however, can do it. Right. Now this is different from a union coming to a quote convention right. with a predetermined right. position right. in support of a candidate. Right. When well, they that do was that, then they lose their voice, it seems to me, in the convention because they're coming to you and saying, we've already decided how we're going. We want you to go this way. Well, that was what they did That's here. That's what the they people. did. <coughs> well, they had some strange reasons for why they wanted to take that position. 
they did that in some county races too where they supported people that wasn't even qualified but they thought they could handle them better wow. and i'm a little bit disturbed about the whole entry of the teacher movement into the labor movement i think if we leave if we stand idly back they'll completely destroy us because yeah, troubles down the road right they didn't evaluate them like we did they didn't have uh, the, the way i understand it they didn't take into any consideration whatsoever on the system that we evaluate candidates they didn't take into no consideration the chance of election at all that didn't even matter to their man yeah. yeah jane what you said may be right right but, but the teacher organization hasn't been dealt with on a cautious basis like you talking about I think if we see that involved, then we should deal with them like I that. I see it. I see it, Bob. I see it. I've seen it in two or three races for a county superintendent of education. They did it solely on a narrow viewpoint of what they figured they could control, not who was right or who was the best qualified or who'd give them the best school, but what could the teachers get out of it and could they control the guy. They feel they can control Mr. Duxworth, and that's why they want him to state super education. They're not evaluating either candidate on the basis of their ability or the educational system they're going to institute. And I'm opposed to that. Yeah, well, well now, when we get to the evaluation of ability, right. I, I'd argue that with you all day because right. I think Mr. Duckworth's qualification. I, I'm not saying you know, he's not qualified. Legal. Don't misread yeah. me. I okay. said I don't think they've looked at that part of it. Well, I, I, maybe they have. Maybe, right. they, maybe they haven't. I think it's been point. strictly from the, from the point and Betty Nelson said that. Yeah. She said it in the meeting. That's, exactly that's not what I said. That's what she said. Well, she Jane, said we are for Duckworth because we can control Duckworth. Well, I couldn't blame them. If I could <laughs> control them, I'd be for them. But it's not the best interest you know, of the, the entire reason, state. And either. the reason we are the candidate, Jane, is because of the fact we think we can have a significant pressure on... But not on control. The There's a difference in, in significant influence and control. The word control means total <laughs> domination to me. And I'm opposed to that by any organization labor or otherwise always have been and will be when they lay me down well the amendment before the house is to lay on the table any action on the superintendent of education position i assume bob until tomorrow at the state code committee meeting mm -hmm. at which time hopefully alt will have representative present if this amendment's adopted then it simply means that we take up <coughs> the rest of the list of candidates see if we can get some action tomorrow we'll make that the first order of business and hopefully better than else will be back from washington uh, and it uh, we'll open that thing up uh, then and there if that needs your approval this amendment adopted do we have any other Mr. discussion Sir, on the amendment i'm, I'm going to speak against the amendment because we're breaking one out here we get on the floor tomorrow and uh this commissioner down here that's a friend of labor, somebody may want to break him out. And then we start the whole the process. Department. Take them individually and, and, you know, we might wind up with five independents, three Republicans, and two Democrats. So I'm a, a opposed to the amendment. I'm going back and I'm going to support the original motion, Democrats straight down the line. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to speak in favor of the amendment I offer. Uh, I'm saying that if, if this is the way the group wishes to do it, then I think they should be at their liberty to do it. I don't think we should endorse a person just because he identified with a party, that because he identified with a specific party don't reflect his adherence to that party's philosophy. And I'm saying a man, whether he is a Republican, a Democrat, or an Independent, he can do things in our favor just as well being identified with one party as he can with the other one. And, and uh, I'm, I'm opposed to saying just endorsing all people because they are simply Democrats, even though I'm a Democrat and I believe in the Democratic philosophy. I'm not saying that everybody that's running as a Democrat is adhering to the Democratic philosophy. I'm, I'm in favor of them. Anybody else wish to speak on the amendment? Ready to vote. All in favor of the amendment to lay on the table the matter of the superintendent of education till tomorrow signify to say an aye. Uh, aye. Opposed? No. 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 Well, in the opinion of the chair, the motion failed to carry. Would you like to have a division on that? No. It's my opinion that it carried the case. Okay. All right, we can back now to the original motion. Do we 
have any further discussion on the original motion? Did you say the man's face? Yeah. Did he say Karen? Well, I thought he said all in the favor of the motion said yes. No, no, I mean it failed. That's what I meant. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they in agreement. They in agreement. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, I'm in agreement that it failed. Right. Well, that's what I, I used the wrong right. word. All right, we're back to the original motion now, and that motion was to endorse the nominees of the Democratic Party for all state. Did that include district positions as well? State and district positions? All state said. and district positions, in other words, the whole work. So right, we have any further yeah. discussion on that motion. That, that, that yes. wasn't included in the motion as uh, for district. Did you include the district? No, we got the statewide. Uh, state uh, what I said was the Democratic nominees of the party. I didn't really stipulate. We got the state, state and district positions. Now we got. Uh, now uh, let's wind this so make make sure everybody understands what we got. We got one incumbent <coughs> uh, public service commissioner, We've got a Republican. <coughs> we got uh, one uh, incumbent public service commissioner, We've got an independent, that's John Dale. Yeah, he got an independent. According to the Secretary of State's office, neither of the three highway commissioners this morning have have an appointment. So if that motion includes public service commissioners, right. you, you, you refer now to the Southern <coughs> District Public Service Commissioner, the Central District Public <coughs> Service Commissioner, if you include the, include the uh, and of course that would include everybody in the Ben and then the Punnett qualifies for the 25th. Yes, that's correct. So you that want to include that. all the district and state positions. Right. Just want to make sure we had all that in the same motion. All right, that's, uh, that's clear enough. Any further discussion now on the motion? Mr. Chairman, uh, it's my understanding that there's supposed to be an independent to come out on the Northern District uh, Highway Commissioner. He's out, isn't he? He isn't announced. He hasn't yet. qualified yet. Yeah. That's the reason I went and called the Secretary of State's office just a few minutes ago. Yeah. And of course, you got to remember that September the 25th is the deadline for independents to qualify. So we can, we're in about the same shape here now as we yeah, were before our last meeting. We need that different. Take that Democratic, yeah, the Democratic <laughs> nominees, regardless of who, whether they qualify or not, this motion means we support the nominees. Right? Just right? Right. make sure everybody understands That's the way what, I understand the what we're about to vote on. Do we have any more discussion on the motion? Question. You ready for the question? All in favor of the motion signify it by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. The motion carried and so ordered. Right, that means that tomorrow, then that we will, in that meeting, we will recommend, we'll make the recommendation to this group uh, known to the State Coke Committee and, and uh, go from there. Now, <coughs> let me let me kind of go over a few things with you. Mr. Chairman, let me, let me ask a question here, if I may. You're not, uh, I, I think I know, but I, I think some of the others are wondering, uh, you're not talking about the uh, people that might be running for legislation. No, no, we just, no. I made a point to clear all this up. No, State central body deal for that. Yeah. Uh, uh, central uh, body deal for that. And you just, no, no, okay. we just, this, this legislative Please thing me. still is a purview of the central bodies, and the central bodies have endorsed a couple of Republicans. Yes, yeah, that's what we, uh, that's the way I understood it. Right. I thought I wanted to be sure that you know, we've got this two, maybe three spread. Republicans that have been endorsed, and, uh, and, they, and I think perhaps they might be supporting an independent, too, for some of the legislative provisions, yes, you know. So Mr. that's this Mr. Chairman, I recommend here. when you make that report, yeah. you make it clear, don't deal with the legislative that's right. 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 Okay. Right. I would do that if we had a couple qualifying Lee County. Let, well, me, let me get into yeah, a couple of things yeah, with you and kind of uh, get uh, your yeah. thinking. We're going to simply reconvene yeah, Saturday yeah. morning, Brother Jackson. Hopefully, you know, the your committee can get them re-registered. Get them seated as soon as possible. Yeah. I have invited the Honorable Heber Ladner to bring the welcome address of this convention. 
the outset, as soon as we have the invitation, that'll be the first thing. We wanted to be afforded an opportunity to say a few words of thanks, and since he's been coming, Secretary of State, since he's been cooperative with us, I felt this would be the appropriate place to bring Heber in. And he'll be here uh, in that capacity, in his position as Secretary of State. I'll have a few words to say if he gets out, try to bring everybody up to date on what's happened up to this point to the last two primaries. And I'll try to keep my remarks to a bare minimum. We'll introduce the guests of the president. We'll have uh, several guests present. And one or two of them might want to have a few brief words to make, but uh, it's going to be very brief. We'll try to get your report uh, right after that. Get the delegates all officially seated where we can then be in a position to do business. And we're going to want to talk to you a little bit about the fact that one or two got seated the last time that shouldn't have. they shouldn't have been. Well, in that mad rush, it may have happened. Oh, yeah, but we'll identify them for you. We want to do this in the event we get into a roll call vote situation. We collected money off everybody we could. Well, that's all I have to get the money. That's all I have to get the money. Don't plead them, though. Well, we didn't let some of them in without the money. Now, at 1040, if we're lucky, we ought to be down ready for convention business. So I have to do, I'll ask Brother Knight to make the report in behalf of the board. We'll take up first the constitutional amendments that you get acted on. We'll get that out of the way. Then we get into the report, the recommendation on the candidate situation. And if we're lucky, you know, there's no way to judge this. If we're lucky, and if the report's adopted and so forth, we'll have Evelyn Gandy standing by. I've asked you to be here somewhere around 11, it's shooting for 11.30, but in the event it goes over real fast, and we want to afford her an opportunity to also address the delegation. But after all, I think in effect we've endorsed her already anyhow. We did, uh, you know, right. in effect. All right, then we recess for lunch, hopefully around noon. Convene again at 1.30. Now at 1.30, We'll have Cliff Finch, the Democratic nominee, standing by, and I'd like to have this executive board act as an escort committee to bring French, uh, French, <laughs> Finch <laughs> to the podium. Well, well, yeah. Yeah. Now, yeah. We don't know how the stage that we have at the other convention. They tore down our stage to dismantle. That's the house. The only stage we got won't seat for four people. Oh, God. Oh. Well, we can send them along the wall. I think that this damn committee here, the executive board, ought to escort this man to the podium. Now, if you have to sit back there against the wall, that's all right. Well, I just want you to know that. All right. Because be we'll arrange that. It'll be a high rise, but they don't, it won't speak for about four or five of the outside. Now, does anybody have any better ideas than that? Don't you think that if we endorse the man, that this executive board ought to escort him to the podium? Huh? Right. All right, then we'll ask you all to stay outside before we reconvene the convention. As soon as we get them seated again after lunch, I'll try to give Tom the word, and you all escort the candidate in. Now, you might want to pick up another one or two to sit with you if we don't have a advisory board present. You said 1.30? 1.30. We're shooting for 1.30. Now, now, let me get into another little thing with you. Get charge out of this, and I hope. I uh, have been spending quite a bit of time on building trade problems, quite a bit of time on the Tom Bigby Waterway, and all that, all those problems, trying to get programs together to make sure the building trade gets that work and establish training programs. George Thomasman in most of these meetings, uh, he was over there yesterday. We had a lengthy meeting in Columbus. <coughs> And of course, I had an opportunity to talk to Robert Byrd quite at length. And so I approached Mr. Byrd about a project, Mr. Knight. This is the thing that I had got around to advising you about because we haven't had the time. About the possibility in this convention of the operating engineer presenting Mr. Cliff Finch with an honorary membership in the operating engineer. <laughs> Let that one sink in for a few minutes. <laughs> He uh, <coughs> rode that bulldozer into the into the uh, into the uh, governor's office, the second primary, and 
we want to make sure that he's properly qualified when he drives that bulldozer up to the to the mansion. And so Bird has agreed to comply with that request. All right. And <laughs> He's agreed that he'll be there, or Mr. Marbury, his assistant, will be there. He don't think he'll have the card that he presented him with a, with a piece of paper that will have all this on it. They'll be making an application for an honorary membership to the International Union. <laughs> then when I got through with all of that, I turned around and I said, the next question, Mr. Bird, I got something like this. I said, what have we got to do to get your organization affiliated with the state of FLCIO? He said, well, I think that all of this is going to help. And if you could, I'd like you to come to my membership meeting Tuesday night. <laughs> so I'll be going down to his membership meeting Tuesday night. Uh, that means that Bird and Marlboro, one of them, will have to be seated as a guest because it's local tonight. Right. Okay, let me, let me say that to the board. Well, Don't you think that is a cute little piece of work here? I think the best way to do it, Tom, is since we're going to have the whole board, we'll only have a couple of chairs up front, one for the bench and one for me, and let the board arrange the chairs where, where the board, one of them is on one side and one on the other, where everybody can see the board. Ain't that, uh, won't that be better? Try to split up that podium? I thought he was a member of the operation. I Claude? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I think Cliff Finch is a member of the operating engineers, or he has been. Well, we're going to find out We're going to find out. On uh, Saturday. We'll find out. He's getting ready to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but Dave's thinking he may have a regular membership in it already. Well, I don't think so. Uh, he had a mention. Uh, anyhow, he's going to be established as an honorary member of this local 624, I believe the number of it, operating engineers. It might, it might be uh, by pulling all this off, we might get an affiliate out of it all. Mm -hmm. Lewis, I think we got Bird kind of embarrassed all this work we've been doing with helping him anyhow. I think he's about ready to come into the organization. Mm -hmm. He can't right. find many excuses to get behind in the moment. You know? Well, I think, uh, I think, Mr. Knight, that, that you ought to. No. But the women that to a split fence. Well, let's see if, see if anybody present here got any ideas about who ought to have on that old sports committee. I'm thinking about the fact that you're going to most likely be up front at this particular time. You're going to present the report. Uh, and, of course, we get it out of way in time. You could uh, turn around and ease outside. We might have to have a recess. It depends on time, you know. There's no, no way to predict the amount of discussion. But I think by all means, Evelyn needs to be escorted, and that uh, this board ought to escort her to yeah, work it out. Huh? Yeah, them. I was wondering if we should make a difference. That's going to be the make a difference. Yeah. You the same. We're going to do the same. I think if you did less, then somebody right, might think we're sliding there. Well, I just want to want to use the board the same way. Yeah, right. That the makes board, more sense. The board just immediately asks the You're going to do it for uh, one. Well, that's the way to do that. As long as we get the report and the recommendations adopted, uh, now there'll be only one door open tomorrow. That'll be the last door back at the bank. Only one door. The rest of them will be locked. I think the fact that Brad Dye's name was left off was the difference to start with in the vote. Yeah, well, we ain't going to have any trouble using the time if we... My problem is if we 
run into a link with a bait. Uh, if things turn out like they did last time, we did get a chance. But I, I don't mind there. telling you, I flabbergasted we got to that last one. Well, when do you predict we're going to finish Saturday? I knew I he was going to run a strong race. No later than 2.30. When Fetch makes his address and we go through this formality of presenting him with the honor and membership at that point, our convention business will be pretty well resolved. We probably need to have a little uh, maybe discussion on a good and welfare if he leaves about the importance of going back and going to work to help elect the man. You know? So we won't break up as soon as he gets through, but I'm predicting about 2.30. Thereabouts. No later than 3. <coughs> Do we have anything else that needs to be considered by this board? Everybody got it? Now we got two or three board members that has quite made it today. We got Marvin Taylor, uh, Doris Miller, and Tucker. We got three of us not here today. What's the, what's the record of the matter with Tucker, brother, son? Well, no, I talked with him yesterday. I have him uh, last night. Now that I got back in, I have him talk with him today. He got problems? Running Kelly's been gone for two hours. <laughs> 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 Somebody, tell Kelly, right. <laughs> Somebody tell Kelly what he's supposed to be. <coughs> Docking. Docking. Well, there's a lot we can talk about, but I think we took care of the most yeah, important 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 business, and I know you you've got other things to do. Nine o'clock this morning, part of it. We will adjourn the meeting for the time being. <laughs> See you tomorrow morning at 9.30.